uh, it's five o'clock. We'll start with the video and then we'll go on to the session. Okay, uh, perfect start. Good evening, everyone, uh, or good morning and good afternoon, wherever you are. Welcome to uh, another uh, international webinar for Inspire and NRF Qatar. Today, we have a very great session, uh, a much awaited uh, session uh, for the last few months, uh, and a very important topic of uh, uh, therapeutic hypothermia in specifically in lower and middle income countries. And uh, we have a very uh, uh, a star faculties today to present and all the experts in the field have come uh, agreed to attend this webinar so we look forward for a great academic discussion and we hope uh, that uh, we'll have a very fruitful discussion and we can, may come up with some conclusion uh, i'll just fail, spend few minutes to introduce our faculties today and the moderators and then the session will begin So I'm Dr. Kiran More. Uh, I'm one of the neurotic consultant working in Sidra Medicine, Doha, Qatar. I'm the host for uh, today's session, and uh, I'll assist moderate, uh, be an assistant moderator. And uh, I'm also president for NNF Qatar and uh, the Inspire organization in Qatar. So our first uh, faculty for today is Professor Sudin Thayal. Um, he's a professor in parental neurosciences and director of center in parental neurosciences in Imperial College, London. He's been chief investigator for severe uh, uh, multi-center study uh, called as Marble Study, and then most recently published trial, the Helix trial, uh, which was uh, looking at the encephalopathy in lower middle income countries. And he's also a, a PI for multiple other trials. And we'll hear, uh, we'll start uh, today's session with his talk. Followed by that, we will have a, a talk from Professor Vishnu Bhatt. Uh, he's a director of medical research and professor in pediatrics in the uh, Jibmer Pondicherry. And uh, we all, I think, know Vishnu, but he's got a uh, lot of publications and he's done multiple trials in cooling and specifically in this field in the Indian region. So we'll be listening to him. Followed by that, we have a panel discussion and we have a very esteemed uh, faculties uh, joining today. Uh, Professor Sita Sankar, and I think needs no introduction. She's a godmother and uh, she's, uh, she's sort of a pioneer for cooling across the globe. She's a professor of pediatrics in Wine State University of School of Medicine, Detroit, Michigan. And uh, she's been uh, in Detroit for almost 26 years. 
and she was the pi for the very first trial nichd trial for cooling in hi and that has set the sort of the ball rolling for cooling in all the across the globe and she's also co pi for multiple trials and she was the pioneer in describing the mri patterns uh, in a brain injury and uh, she's co she's one of the co pi for this helix trial as well so she will be participating in the panel today we have a, a, a more esteemed panelist uh, today, Dr. Dinesh Chilra. He's a director of intensive care Royal Children's Hospital in Hyderabad. And we can, Dinesh is a very popular uh, faculty in many sort of uh, present, uh, conferences in India and even some overseas. And he's got uh, numerous publications. He's a joint secretary of NNF uh, in last year and this year, and chairperson elect of IIP Pediatric Intensive Care Chapter 2022. We also have a, a panelist, Sridhar Kalyan Sundaram. Uh, he will be representing the uh, sort of neurotologist from the Middle East because this discussion do apply to the Middle East as well. So he's a consultant neurotologist working in uh, Danat Al Emirat Hospital in Abu Dhabi, UAE. He's trained in JIPMER, PGI, and then also Cambridge, UK. And he works as a consultant in Glasgow and also has numerous publication and, uh, and, and also ex interest in this field. We have uh, Dr. Isma Jahan. Uh, she's an assistant professor and uh, working in Bangladesh, uh, Sheikh Mujib Medical University. She is one of the site coordinator for Helix trial, and she's representing today's, uh, as Prof Professor Shaidullah couldn't make it, but she'll be sharing her experience of participating in the Helix trial. And last and uh, not the least, uh, Dr. Suman Rao. She's a professor, St. John Medical College, Bangalore. She has, uh, she's a consultant uh, and uh, department of MCA and coordinated a lot of trials, including the KMC trial. The, uh, she's also chairperson for the perinatal committee and Milan uh, forum and more than 100 publication, 140 uh, paper presentations and lots of lectures. And she's going to take the lead to moderate this session and try to steer the session in the right direction. So a lot of uh, uh, responsibility, Dr. Suman. And Dr. Arvan and is my colleague, sorry, I missed his slide. Uh, he's also one of my colleagues um, uh, who's trained in Canada and uh, consultant attendance, attending in uh, Sidra Medicine, Doha, Qatar, and he's our neurocritical lead. So he'll be also co-moderating the session. And we, without delaying, I will hand over and stop sharing the screen. And I'll ask Dr. Sudin to start the session. Over to you, Professor Sudin. Thank you, Kiran, for the uh, kind introduction and organizing this um, webinar and uh, inviting me to talk. So I'm going to discuss the Helix trial um, results and the implications. I hope um, most of the delegates participating in this webinar have already read the Helix paper. Um, if not, please do read it fully, not just start start read the paper fully. But this is a brief summary. So it is a open label uh, phase three randomized control trial with masked outcome assessments. 408 infants from um, South Asian neonatal units with moderate and severe encephalopathy were um, enrolled and randomized. And then um, uh, the intervention group was whole body cooling. Control group was usually intensive care with avoidance of hypothermia. And the primary outcome was the composite of death or moderate or severe disability at 18 months. So, and the primary outcome was seen in 50% of the cooled infants and 47% of the control infants with a p-value of 0.55. And um, we had a primary outcome in 97%. So there is a follow-up rate. And the conclusion of the trial was that the whole body, whole body cooling does not reduce death or disability after moderate or severe encephalopathy in LMICs. So that's the trial in nutshell. So what I'm going to uh, discuss today um, is not the end point, uh, but how we got there, the making of the helix trial. Because before we get to the final point of uh, you, you know one of the greatest moments in our history, um, there is a lot of net practice that we need to do, a lot of practice matches, and then we get to the final um, final match and the final win. So that's what we did with the Helix trial. So this is um, a decade of work 
by a lot of um, uh, people from India, Bangladesh, and, um, um, and Sri Lanka. A um, lot of very passionate and committed people. Um, one of them uh, has joined as a panel here, Isma Chahan. So before the trial, there was almost five years of feasibility studies and pilot studies, and then we did the main trial. So what you actually see in the Lancet, the 10 pages is actually 10 years of work. So uh, what I mean by pilot studies is that pilot studies when we do, um, they are not powered for the primary outcome. That's how you differentiate the pilot study and the main trial. And you can either use a biomarker outcome or a short term outcome, but essentially they will not have adequate power for the primary outcome. And you don't necessarily need to have an IDMC in a pilot study. Um, but of course, when you do a main trial, you do need to have an IDMC. Um, if not, you're in big trouble. And you don't need the same um, governance requirements and smaller teams can do pilot studies. But it's absolutely essential to do those before you jump onto the main trial. So um, like I said, that went on for many, many years before we embarked on the Helix trial. So a lot of you know, net practices, a lot of practice matches, and then um, the final game. And um, of course, we cannot say we've won a lot of practice matches, just give us the World Cup, it doesn't work like that. You do need to win the final game. And that's what we had eventually. So um, I'm just going to discuss some of the decisions we made uh, in the Helix trial and how we got there, um, essentially the making of the trial. So how did we select uh, the population um, that we recruited into the Helix trial? So we all know, I'm just going to use India as an example here. We all know the population is very diverse. Um, some of the richest people in the world live in India. And of course, some of the poorest people um, uh, live there too. Um, and, uh, and whom do you choose? This is a famous inverse care law, um, initially published in Lancet by, um, by a very enterprising GP called, um, general practitioner called Julian Tudor Hart, who died uh, last year. So he, he coined this for the first time, inverse care law, which we all know now, that the availability of medical care is inversely proportionate to the needs of the population. So in India, we have top and uh, private hospitals uh, there in blue, uh, which has got the same uh, facilities and, um, and services the population, um, which are pretty similar to high income countries. Um, that's at the top end but they do have lower delivery rates and very high cesarean rates. So many hospitals like we did explore, including Manipal Hospital, but it had a cesarean rate of almost 80%. Um, so I'm not sure what the burden of encephalopathy in those settings are, but of course, you know, if cooling is effective in those settings, it doesn't mean it can be extrapolated to, to all other settings. And if you go to the other bottom end, um, where uh, if you go to the villages and private population who don't have access to proper healthcare, uh, which unfortunately does form a big chunk of India, um, as in sub-Saharan Africa, cooling clearly does not work. It's dangerous to do cooling there. And one of my uh, colleagues, Nick, Nicky Robertson, has shown that if you do cooling in those settings, you're going to increase mortality. Um, and then there's a big chunk of tertiary and secondary care with a huge burden of encephalopathy in India. But we decided to go towards the top end just because we want to be uh, make sure the cooling was safe and effective in those settings before going on to less the uh, resource secondary and tertiary intensive care units in India. So the, the, the population, the hospitals we selected were public sector hospitals, academic centers with moderately high burden of HIA, usually around five to 10 per thousand live births. And all these hospitals had facilities for ventilation, cardiovascular support, um, and a two, two or three tied medical care. So there was a specialist neonatal consultant. And then um, uh, in the UK, we call that as senior house officer or a registrar. So those were junior doctors equal in there. And um, a neonatal nurses with a ratio mostly between one is two, um, two to four. So that is, that is science. And this is one of the trial sites in um, Bangalore, in Indira Gandhi Hospital. Although um, we had very good relations with one of the nearby hospitals called Wani Villas, um, we had a huge, huge burden of encephalopathy, which are also a kind of tertiary intensive care. We did not feel cooling would be appropriate there. So that's why we chose a nearby hospital called Indira Gandhi. This is the neonatal intensive care unit there. Um, 
as you can see, the cooling is being given, given by um, a tachothermia machine there. And these are the trial sites of um, Helix in India, in South India, um, primarily. Um, Sand Hospital in Mumbai, um, uh, Indira Gandhi Hospital in Bangalore, two hospitals in Madras, um, Kelani University in Sri Lanka, Trinidad Medical College, and um, BSMMU from Jhaka. So these were the Helix style sites. Now, the second issue is so how did you select these babies? How did you make sure these babies uh, did have moderate or severe encephalopathy and not mild encephalopathy? So if I, um, the, the key to it is to do a very good uh, standardized neurological examination. So we had certified examiners at all sites. So this is a, a structured examination that um, Sita Shankar had developed for the NICHG trials and has been validated extensively in a number of um, high profile publications subsequently. So this is exactly what we use. There is a system for training and certification of um, all the investigators and, and, and the people who were recruiting, which um, both Sida and I did. So all of them are certified and validated. Um, these exams are never available online. And also um, you know, there are a number of documents that's freely available if anybody wants to learn this. But it is absolutely essential to do, it as, to do a structured examination. Otherwise, you will overcall mild HIES moderate for sure, unless you use um, um, amplitude integrated EEG alongside. I mean, in, in, in the UK, nobody is very good at doing this. Even in the UK, most people don't do a proper neuro exam and will are cooling babies with mild encephalopathy. Um, but if I ask my colleagues, they will invariably say, oh no, we don't cool mild HIES, it's all moderate. But unless you do um, such an examination, you will end up cooling mild HIES for sure. So this is what we did for Helix time. Now, why is the standardization so vital? Because we really want to pick up the high-risk group, the high-risk infants with moderate or severe HI. But why is that so important? So this is a graph. Just look at this graph carefully. I'll show this again. So this is plotting the power of the study against the control event rates. By control event rates, what we mean is the adverse events in the control group. So that's control event rates. The sample size of any trial depends on the control event rates. So any intervention in newborns will have around a third relative risk reduction. You can pretend it has got 100% um, relative risk reduction and has smaller sample size, but in reality, it doesn't work like that. So if you assume a 30% relative risk reduction, this is a graph you will get. So imagine uh, we are doing a trial of 400 infants and your event rate is 50%. You have then around you know, over 80% power. Now, if you recruit infants with milder encephalopathy or milder brain injury, your event rate will come down, say come down to 30%. All of a sudden, your power of the tri trial is down to less than 50%. That's a disaster. Then you cannot conclude anything. And of course, you know, if the event rate is much lower, um, you're in big, big trouble and something is seriously wrong. So that is why the standardization of encephalopathy is so vital. But we did not use quad pH as an inclusion criteria, and I'll tell you why. I mean, of course, you know, uh, quad pH is a useful indicator because metabolic acidosis may indicate a recent hypoxic event. But more importantly, lack of acidosis may suggest lack of a significant event as well. But the issue in LMIC is that um, outbound infants rarely have quad pH done. And although many trials do report uh, as quad pH as an inclusion criteria in LMIC, it, the denominator data that, that is rarely reported. So I don't know, you know how, how many babies do actually get a quad pH done, um, um, especially among outbound babies. And that limits the generalizability um, in LMICs. But instead, we use pH at admission, metabolic acidosis at admission, which was available in more than 90% in the helix trial. And we made sure we excluded alternative causes of encephalopathy, you know, metabolic genetic causes, and so on. Now, how did we fine tune our intervention and what kind of pilot studies did we do? So this was the first randomized control trial, pilot randomized control trial we did. Like I said, it was not powered for the clinical outcomes. So we used um, um, something called phase change material, which is a bit like ice, but instead of melting at zero degrees, it can it melts at a set temperature, um, 27 or 28, whatever you want to set it. 
So this was um, the, this is the first human demonstration of a phase change material in, in uh, for therapeutic hypothermia. So this mattress was developed by a company called Chimeter. It's pretty cheap, just 100 um, um, pounds, which will be 10,000 rupees, Indian rupees, it would seem. And this is the uh, near nature unit in Calicut Medical College um, that you can see um, the photo. So we appointed around six research nurses to do the study, at least to provide a good one-to-one um, -one care um, when they were getting cooling. So we managed to um, do therapeutic hypothermia with face and material, but my concern was both induction and rewarming cannot be controlled because uh, there is no induction or rewarming phase in those. And the cooling efficacy is dependent on, on the ambient temperature. So when the temperature was uh, pretty high, which can happen in tropical uh, countries, it doesn't work. But we, we found that we used um, Thompson's criteria as an inclusion then uh, in this uh, trial rather right? than an ICHT um, criteria. But we found that was, that was just not good. We are recruiting infants with mild encephalopathy. We also found that there was a lot of white matter injury in this population, a lot of microcephaly. So there was something which uh, the pop some population differences were apparent um, in the small study. And then we went on to develop, uh, we got a grant from the Gates Foundation, but we went on to uh, develop this server control cooling device, which is essentially like an old Nokia, Nokia phone. If you people still remember, this is not, this is the, the Nokia version of the iPhone um, that we now use, but it does a job. There's only one set temperature of 38, 33.5 degree. You switch it on, it just maintain that. And then you can switch a button off after, after 72 hours, it'll rewarm at 0.5 degree per hour. So this is uh, um, the device we developed, uh, was just costing 500 pounds, um, around 50,000 rupees, uh, in collaboration with industry partner called um, Inspiration Healthcare. So our only condition was that until uh, we have the results from the Helix trial, they should not market it because you know I don't want to market a device. I'm just going to where we are uh, uncertain about the uh, um, the safety and efficacy, and the company was pretty happy with that. So this is one of the meetings we had um, in Calicut at the time. So uh, one of the representatives, Nikki from uh, Inspiration Healthcare, or there, and you can see Professor uh, Vishnu Bhatt who has been an absolute pioneer in this field and, and a true inspiration uh, figure for me. And this is uh, Sruti, uh, one of the DM fellows doing um, a study on cooling at Shipmer at that time. So, so we did the initial pilot studies with, um, uh, with this machine. So this is the baby we used um, the trial in Calicut as well. But eventually, both these hospitals um, uh, could not participate. In Calicut Medical College, you thought it was more like an upper secondary level care than a proper tertiary full-blown. And um, in Jipma, there was a lot of nascent shortages and getting it, um, uh, hourly data was difficult. So eventually, both these trials um, units could not participate, although there were a lot of credit does goes to go to these two centers, um, both to Professor Bushnu, but, and also to Professor Kumuda from, um, uh, she's not in this photo from, um, um, Madras Medical College who was also present in that meeting. And then we did some pilot studies using this machine in Madras Medical College. So this is the data from 58, about 120 babies, 58 cool babies and 112 uh, infants to, uh, um, uh, to usual care, which is kind of normothermia, although we didn't measure the temperatures of those infants in the study. And the mortality rate was a half in the cooled infants, which was quite reassuring. Of course, uh, you know, you cannot say anything um, about safety and efficacy of cooling from a non-randomized trial, but this was uh, reassuring. And then we went on to do the full uh, main helix trial. And the main helix trial, we used this machine called Hecotherm Neo. And the reason why we used that was because there was no um, downloading function of all the data in the Tecotem Helix because, and we wanted to examine um, uh, the rectal temperature every minute, which we could do with um, this machine. So um, the key question, of course, you people would ask is, did we actually achieve the target temperature within six hours, um, which we did. This machine was highly effective. Within 10 minutes, you know, you can really rapidly cool down infants um, with this machine. And all except three infants did have a rectal temperature um, of uh, 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 target temperature less than 34 at six hours. 
and in the three who did not have um, reached that temperature by seven levels in the next hour. Now, we use normothermia as a control group, um, although this was not, um, this was, um, we were wiser by that time, by the experience of the original cooling trials um, and that Professor Sita Shankaran and um, um, the Toby trial um, that Imperial College did earlier. Because all the original cooling trials had a lot of hypothermia and hypothermia in the control arm, which we now know will worsen the adverse outcome. So the adverse effects of hypothermia is several times higher than the beneficial effects of cooling. So um, see, there was absolute adamant we should have you know, strict guidelines for avoiding hypothermia, um, which I'm quite glad we did. And uh, we also measured the temperature for 90 hours, not just 72 hours, to make sure you, know, you don't get a fever later on. And then we measured, continued the measurement for the first one week, um, since eight hours um, later on. Uh, and we avoided hypothermia by setting lower temperatures in the radiant warmers and, and a lot of other things. But despite all this, 10 infants did have at least one episode of hypothermia because it's just so difficult to prevent in um, high, high resource settings um, or, or the high resource settings in low in, infant countries. Hypothermia is just so common. It's uncommon in uh, sub Saharan Africa where you don't have radiant warmers, but in the UK, hypothermia was very common prior to the cooling trials. But all the ones who had hypothermia had adverse outcomes. So the ones who had a temperature of more than 39, all of them died. The ones who had temperature between 38 to 39, they were survived but had disability. So be very, very careful of you know, avoiding hypothermia um, in these infants. Now, was the concern rate in helix tile truly informed? Uh, it's never, you know, uh, this is one of the biggest challenges, no, not just in LMICs, but in the UK, because parents just have a few hours to make a decision um, when their child is just so sick. And it's very easy to say yes without understanding what you're signing up to. So we made sure we trained all the people as much as we can. A lot of mock training went on before they were allowed to consent. And then we video recorded all the consenting. And then we analyzed all these videos in a um, quantitative way. So we looked at how uh, empathetically the clinician was talking to parents. We looked at whether they provided all information about the trial. And then we looked at whether they had the autonomy to withdraw from the trial or not to participate without giving a reason. And without um, uh, and, and understanding that that would not affect the quality of the care that their infant would receive. So it all scored highly um, on, um, on these quantitative measurements, but always, as always, the devil um, is in the detail. So we then went back and did qualitative interviews with the parents and also with the clinicians. So this is one of my fellows, Tudipan, so she did his qualitative interviews. And then when we asked these parents, they said, uh, yes, we did participate. We participated because uh, the doctor wanted, uh, told us to. They had complete trust in doctors. And that's why they did, which is a good thing. This is the same thing they would do in the UK as well. And they felt that the treatment was beneficial um, and it should be you know, given to more people. So this was before we um, unmasked the data from the Helix trial. They did not know the results, but they thought the cooling was pretty beneficial. Same from clinicians. So clinicians uh, really uh, was finding it difficult to explain the concept of randomization. And this is an issue, not just in LMICs, but in the UK. It's very difficult to explain randomization to patients. They would just want the intervention arm, not the control arm. And clinicians were not happy because a lot of hospitals were already cooling um, uh, in, in, in LMICs. So they were had this thing we call as moral distress. Now, how did we ensure randomization quality and the quality assurance of the trial? So we had a web-based remote randomization with a strict audit trail and inclusion criteria logs. So what I mean is that if the infant is more than six hours, six hours is in one minute, then it will not allow you to randomize. And we cross-check this by checking the time of birth uh, to ensure this integrity. That's absolutely important because by, you know, people trying to help, people might push a baby um, son of a, hours of age into the trial, just trying to help but that's not good. So this process will not allow that. 
And of course, we examined the temperature data by downloading it. We had extensive training and very dedicated and committed research nurses and a core team of fellows um, at each of those sites. That was absolutely crucial. And the, you know, whenever I appoint a research nurse, I tell them, it's absolutely fine to have missing data. Um, I don't like it. Uh, they will get some, uh, they'll get told when there's missing data. But if you force that's your last day uh, with our research group, you'll be dismissed instantly. So, and they knew that they were really, you know, absolutely committed uh, people. I um, uh, really had soft their hard work and we couldn't have done um, with the dedication of commitment of the team. And of course, um, there were automated algorithms to look at the data accuracy and so on. And all the data was checked at multiple levels, um, by the local levels, local PAs, uh, trial managers, and I, uh, we went through every single variable uh, in every single case. Um, and we, like I said, we examined the videos of all consent and stored them. Uh, whenever they say almost all cases we used to discuss in real time, there's a WhatsApp group, we just used to discuss any case. If there's any complex case, both Sita Shankaran and I used to discuss the management. Assessment of Baileys again was cross-checked. Each form's photos of Baileys were taken. Um, not because you know, a lot of things are, uh, we do a standard in any clinical trial in the UK and um, um, routinely, but we went an extra mile. Not that we didn't trust the local teams. Of course, we had, you know, I had absolute, um, they were absolutely committed teams, but in case people points, um, you know, we just need to be absolutely sure the data quality is, is put on um, when we do these kind of trials. Now, why did we choose a primary outcome of um, death and disability at 18 months? All the high country cooling trials have done that. And, and that's for a reason. This is a well accepted and standard thing that the primary outcome for any neuroprotective intervention should be 18 months, a composite of death and disability, because they're competing outcomes. Um, uh, you know, I would have liked if we could do an assessment at one month, it would have made my life much easier um, because all my work is on neonatal encephalopathy, but, but we can't. We cannot assess the development prior to the age of 18 months. That's the earliest we can do. So um, absolutely mandatory primary outcome should be the composite of death and disability because um, if you have more death, the disability can be artificially lower and vice versa because they're competing outcomes. And uh, the issue in using this outcome in LMIC is that the follow-up is extremely challenging. You know, often there's a migrant population, they change um, homes, uh, not just from um, one place to another, but into different states um, altogether. And I'm not aware of any trial that has got a high rate of clinical trial that has been done in LMICs with a high follow-up and a rigorous, uh, rigorous neuro, uh, neurodiagnostic assessment. So this was a huge, very tall order uh, when we started off, but um, really admiring, um, uh, you know, hats off to all the people who managed to do this. Um, so people traveled, investigators traveled, long distances taking flights at times to uh, travel to different states to do the Bailey examinations. And it was um, especially challenging during COVID. So we had to do all those um, PPE stuff, mask and op use open air assessments and so on. So all the examinations were standardized um, and they did uh, mass assessments of the outcome. Now, we had a very experienced IDMC team uh, in Helix trial. And, and why is that? Um, um, I'll tell you why it's that important in a minute. So this team had one of the two of the top people um, in the field, uh, Prof. Ebert Lapduck, who was a PI of a number of um, cooling trials, including the delayed cooling trial in, by NICHT, um, and Aaron, one of the most respected people um, and another authority in the field, and Prof. Uh, Shabbar Jaffa, a professor of epidemiology and head of Leopold School of Tropical Medicine, um, absolute uh, le leader um, in epidemiology and statistics. So. And then we also had two neonatologists, one from the UK and one from India, um, Neranjan Thomas, um, which many of you would know, very passionate uh, um, and committed people. And there was a clear statistical analysis plan um, and, um, and the protocol was published um, prior hand. And you know, in clinical trials, it's absolutely mandatory to stick with the statistical analysis plan. If you say, oh, say for example, if you're one of the outcome is um, 
near at mortality is not same as mortality at, at discharge and you cannot use it interchangeably and you need to specify mortality at 20 days is not same as mortality at 30 days so whatever you say in your statistical analysis plan prior to the trial you should just do so in dream analysis was done uh, five times during the trial and and the idmc was uh, watching like a hawk and once the uh, trial results were published and there was harm in one group both see the uh, and i went back to the idmc and said you know look why did you not stop the trial because one of the previous trials um, that Sita Shankaran did, um, the optimizing cooling trial was stopped for futility. And they were absolutely clear. They were really watching, um, like I said, like a hawk at the data. And when we went back and looked at the mortality, the, the data results we would have after each 100 recruits, and this is what we found. The first 100 recruits, absolutely no difference in p-value. Just one p-value, same even rates in both. First 100, again, no difference. First 300, again, no, no significant difference. And there's only when we got to the full 408, for more than 400, the difference came. So the IDMC did uh, make an absolutely um, uh, correct call in continuing the trial, uh, but of course not allowing it to go any further than originally planned. So really hands off to the hard work of the IDMC as well. So then the, uh, the final thing is whether the highly style reporting was comprehensive, which we think is, uh, so you should read that paper. There's extensive data, um, both in the main paper and also in the supplementary appendix. So we could have easily published 10 different papers from the data, but we decided to just publish one paper with all, all the information in. So it'll take you a good afternoon to read the paper carefully. And, and before we published uh, unmasked the data, when um, we had a meeting of all investigators in the team, and we interviewed all the teams um, separately and recorded this, because it's pretty common in randomized controlled trials. Once we unmask and analyze the data, uh, some PIs may not like what they find, and they might, you know, so we just made sure everything was recorded prior to unmasking. And I was really surprised at the peer reviewers. They were just so uh, supportive and they just so impressed with the quality of the Haley style data. And same with the Lancet editors. But uh, do read all the comments of about the Haley style, which is published in the uh, in the Lancet and the reply, and again the supplementary appendix. That that so that's again um, was quite uh, pleasing. But what was so different about the Haley style and Heineken country trial? So here we are looking at the three main cooling trials, um, the NHTST, the first uh, whole body cooling trial, NHTST trial published in NAGM now almost 15 years back, uh, led by Sita Shankaran, cool cap trial and the Toby trial um, led by Imperial College. If you look at the death, the outcomes of death, disability, uh, follow up rate and sepsis rate was pretty much the same in all the studies. Birth weight was half a kilo lesser um, in helix trial because the population was different. But the striking differences are in red. Hypothermia, like I said, was very low in helix trial compared to other trials. But look at the incidence of seizures. Many more infants had seizures at the time of randomization in helix trial compared to the high income country cooling trials. And much lower proportion had acute central events like um, cord collapse, abruption, and so on compared to the high income country cooling trials. But is the data similar to other cooling trials? Um, I think so. I would, um, if you look at the birth weight, uh, it's pretty similar. If you look at the perinatal central events, it's pretty similar in LMIC cooling trials. Most of them had um, reported um, event rates, uh, perinatal cent uh, central events in five to 10%. Um, most of them had a similar nest into thin trial from CMC Willow, which is one of the recently well-resourced private hospitals in. South India, they had a nurse to infant ratio one is to three to four. Many trials had even worse or not, um, uh, not even reported um, those kind of supportive care. Again, hyperthermia in controlled arms. I'm surprised none of the Indian trials have reported that, but I'm pretty surprised. It's extremely unlikely um, that um, they did not have hyperthermia, but it's not been reported in, in those studies. Early onset seizures, again, very similar, um, almost 80%, more than 80% in many of the trials. 
and I'm really interested to uh, know about uh, prosecution birds experience in this um, early onset seizures and this infants. And of course, Helix is the only one which uses servo control cooling device. All other devices, um, all other um, trials used low cost manual devices. So, but if you look at the, so in Helix trial, we are lucky that our event rate was pretty similar. The control event rate was pretty similar to what we predicted. Um, so we had um, more than 80% power for our primary outcome. But one of the other uh, phase three trials, the last trial, um, um, by Zobo et al. from China, multi-center trial. Um, that trial um, had an, uh, a power of um, uh, around 50%. Um, but other studies, excellent, excellent studies, a lot of them led by Professor Bishnu, but um, had powers of 30% um, um, or lower. Um, a thin trial, again, a very good study from CMC Willow had 5% power. So these are you know, very useful studies, um, but we should not make a definitive conclusions about clinical efficacy using this. And if you combine all these um, uh, results, um, um, again, it's pretty much similar. So the only two trials are reported death and disability in, an, in, in a masked way um, from LMICs, um, as far as we, we could see. But um, hypothermia does not improve the composite out outcome of death and disability when you look at the pool data. So, this again uh, for us was published. If you look into the appendix in the Lancet paper, you can see that. If you look at the mortality, again, cooling does not reduce mortality at hospital discharge in LMIC when I mean, you look at the pool data. That's all fine. But when I talk to a lot of my friends, they say, they'll say, you know, Swim, this is all fine. But in my experience, cooling does work. How do you explain that? So I'm going to explain uh, by using this model. So imagine this is based on, this is one of the mouse experiments based on um, the original Paolo's thinking. So uh, this is a mouse and every time this mouse um, touches the red button, it gets an electric shock. Every time it touches the blue button, it gets some pellets to eat. So of course the mouse will keep on touching the uh, green button or blue button more and more. And if you look at what people do, so we start with cooling um, babies with mild, moderate or severe encephalopathy, which is continuum. No baby is going to say, I got mild, I got moderate or I got severe. It's, it's very difficult unless you do a very standardized examination as we discussed. And then what do you find? The ones with severe HI are, are dying more often. Then you stop uh, cooling severe HI, you try and focus more on the mild, mild and moderate one. Then you see the moderate end ones are also dying. Then you start, then your drift starts again. Uh, you're starting cooling just with babies born in poor condition, but with no HIE. And this circle goes on. And this is what uh, that has happened in the UK, not just in LMIs, in the UK as well. So following introduction of cooling therapy in the UK, I think we have eradicated mild HIE. People will say, oh, we don't see, you know, we don't cool mild HIE. That's just suddenly disappeared. So where has this gone? Now, you know, if you look at this excellent data from the Indian um, neonatal collaborative, 17 units, this is the kind of studies we need. 350 um, infants, 211 um, cooled. They did not find um, that therapeutic hepatitis reduced neonatal mortality. But when they, when we look at the pH, uh, cod pH, only 14% um, had had a cod pH of less than seven. So vast majority of these infants would not have met the cooling criteria for high income country cooling trials. And only 17% were ventilated and majority were ventilated for less than a day. So these are very, very much sicker, less sicker infants in um, compared to the Helix trial or the high income country cooling trials. In Helix, a vast majority were ventilated um, and almost all of them were on inotropic support and, and so on. But despite um, this, 17% either died or went on DAMA in this uh, registry data. So this is again, you know, how generalizable is the helix trial data? You need to go, you know, we need to look at this pyramid again. Of course, there are settings and populations in India where cooling would be effective, but that is pretty uh, low on the top blue end. And the vast majority, uh, that's not, unfortunately, that's not the case. Now, uh, in, and of course, you know, in, um, in pediatric cardiac, pediatric and adult cardiac arrest trials, we know initially the original trials um, 10 years back showed that cooling was effective in that population. 
hypothermia was neuroprotective and the standard care was hypothermia. But the recent larger randomized control trial showed if we give targeted temperature management or targeted uh, nomothermia, it is as effective as hypothermia. So many hospitals are now using um, um, therapeutic nomothermia instead of therapeutic hypothermia following pediatric and adult um, cardiac arrest. And of course, you know, you can make any guideline as you like, but any guideline is as good as the evidence you have um, for that. So is cooling still effective in South Asia? I think that's the wrong question to ask. What we should be now focusing on, why is cooling not effective um, in these settings? So there are two ways to look at that. One is um, by looking using MR biomarkers um, and other is looking at some mechanistic work. So I'm just going to briefly uh, mention, discuss this before I conclude. So this is some uh, this is a multicenter study we did called Marble Study um, uh, to validate, to develop good biomarkers of uh, MR biomarkers of later outcome in neonatal encephalopathy. So um, we developed specific sequences for this to quantify MR spectroscopy metabolites and, um, and to um, harmonize the fractional anisotropy um, acquisitions. And what we found was that this chemical, this metabolite called NAA or n aspartate. So this is something that is seen only in the neurons in your brain. And when neurons get damaged, the level of NAA goes down. And that predicts um, your adverse outcome quite accurately. And so does the ratio of lactate to NAA. But the issue with lactate to NAA is that the spread is, is much more clumped. We can see the nice spread of NAA. You don't see that with um, lactate NAA. But you do need to do a lot of harmonization work before you do uh, these kind of studies. It's very easy. All the modern scanners come with these packages. So it's very easy to click a button and get the data, but that data will not be accurate unless you do a lot of optimization and harmonization work. So this is what we did. Our physicists went around. Um, we did a lot of work with fandoms, adult volunteers at all the sites in India, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh. Um, I will not go into details, but there is a lot of technical things you, you need to do before you acquire the data and before you analyze the data. And particularly be, be, because if you do this in 100 cases, you'll get good quality data in only 50. So how are you going to decide which 50 you're going to include and 50, which 50 you're going to exclude? And that'll make a big bias unless you decide beforehand how you are going to exclude poor quality data. So before you even analyze this data, you should have criteria on exclusion how we are going to uh, do that. And of course, there should be all masked to all the allocation and the outcomes and so on. So we had criteria based on the uh, peak line width and a lot of other um, um, other characters of spectroscopy and, and, and diffusion MRI and so on. And then two MR physicists independently performed all the analysis um, using very validated pipelines. And again, you know, this is the uh, this is the um, the flow chart um, that um, that's again reported in the Lancet paper. There's a very strict protocol of how you analyze this data. Otherwise, you'll have bias. What it allows, what MRI allows, is to look more deeply into the underlying nature of the brain injury and to look at the subgroups more carefully. So when we looked at the conventional MR um, injury and the MRI scores many infants had white matter injury. Um, and of course, therapeutic hemothermia did, was not beneficial, did not decrease the brain injury in any of these infants. When we looked at the MR spectroscopy, no difference between um, uh, the metabolite levels in thalamic NA or lactate NA. Um, same with fresh anisotropy, no difference in the cooled or usually care infants. But this also allow us to look at um, more detail in, in subgroups. So when we looked at the subgroup of uh, inborn infants, again, no difference. The, the was brain injury was no, uh, no less uh, whether it was inborn or outborn infants. NA ratios were similar. So was selected NA and so was fresh anisotropy. Same with moderate to severe HA. There was no effect of hypothermia in that group. Now, so, so why is this? Is there any genetic differences or is it differences in the mechanisms? So the way you can look at is by um, um, by looking at, you can look at their um, DNA to look at this genetic differences. So we did whole genome sequencing in all those infants in the Helix trial, that data, um, we're just analyzing that data now. But I'd be surprised if there is any 
genetic underlying differences. What I think is the mechanisms may be different. So you can look at mechanisms by looking at the expression of genes. So instead of looking at the DNA, you look at um, RNA. So essentially how um, things work in your body is that your DNA is telling your RNA, you, you know, you go and make this protein and, and that's how you look at the expression of RNA. So when you have an insult, your expression of RNA changes. So, and this expression of RNA, so you do next generation sequencing, you collect blood in specific RNA stabilizing bottles and then you, you look at, you do next generation sequencing and you look at each of those genes. So in this graph, what you're seeing is babies with encephalopathy in red and healthy infants in, um, in blue. So each of this vertical column is a baby and each of this tiny line is a gene. And if the gene is upregulated, it's given in red. And if it is downregulated in green. So you can see there's a clear pattern, um, a difference between HIV babies and um, uh, healthy infants. And, and the genes which are involved in HI is very different to um, the healthy infants and also the infants with sepsis and so on. So um, uh, those genes are very different. And also these gene expressions correlate with the later adverse outcomes. But they also change with time. So gene expression you know, changes with time um, um, in, in babies with HI. So he, in this graph, what you're seeing is the blue dots are infants with encephalopathy. The darker ones are time points uh, soon after birth, within six hours. The lighter ones are later time points. So the lighter it is, so this is done every um, so at six hours, 24 hours, 48 and 72 hours. So the lightest one is at 72 hours and in between are you know 24 and 48 hours. So they separate, but the separation is different to how healthy babies separate. So you can still, you can really um, use this to time the injury when this is happening. And so this is what we did. So we then we looked at the mechanism. Are there any differences in the mechanisms of brain injury in uh, in Healy's trial and in in the UK in high income countries? So in in high income countries, what we see following acute hypoxia is that the hip pathway, the hypoxia induced factor pathway, is upper, uh, is changed. So typically NADH pathway, EAF2 signaling, and so on. But what we found in LMICs was a different pathway. It's a new um, mechanism called ferroptosis, which is prominent. prominent. And, and, and this is a new uh, mechanism that's been described only recently, only a few years back, um, similar to, um, you know, just like we have apoptosis, another mechanism, ferroptosis is another mechanism, which is more related to chronic inflammation and so on. But we also found was that the diet, there was some HIF signaling abnormalities in uh, the helix babies as well. But the direction of that signal was different. So in, um, in the UK population, we found that these were down-regulated. So in, you're seeing in this graph, you got the fold change on your y-axis. So if the fold change is less than zero, it's down-regulated, or it's in green, it's down-regulated. If it's in red, it is up-regulated. So these genes were, down-regulated in high-income countries, but up-regulated up at birth in, um, in the Helix trial. So then, then we try to look at the trajectory, how what is happening. So what we think is happening, and then this, these are plots um, that I mentioned from time zero, time T1 is 24 hours, T2 is 48, and T3 is 72. So we have a nice trajectory there. But so, the HIF pathway is down-regulated at birth in uh, high countries, and then it gets upregulated before coming down again. But these pathways were already upregulated at birth in LMICs. So this indicates two things. One is that your mechanism is different, more ferroptosis, more um, chronic inflammation, and so on. B, the timing is also different. It's probably happening around 24 hours prior to um, the birth um, in this population. Now, why is that? What does it, um, what do we do with this information? Now, you know, th these are not things we've been thinking about previously. Is there an effect of ethnicity? Probably not ethnicity, the socioeconomic factors. How does brain injury, how does these things influence brain injury? So this is a recent data published from the NPU in Oxford, the National Perinatal Epidemiology Unit um, by Jenny Kurinsek. Um, you know, highlighting higher risk of death in Indian and uh, BAME 
um, population in the UK. So even the deprivation in the UK is having effect on neonatal mortality. We don't know how it's affecting the brain injury. That's some uh, data from Sweden. The immigrant population is having higher risk of encephalopathy. And now, Jenny Kurensik is a person who did the original um, trial in Australia. You might remember this trial published in BMJ many, many years back, um, showing antenatal risk factors um, were the main reason for encephalopathy in Australia. At that time, the study was very controversial, but this is the data um, the same team has published recently. So I think we are just learning all these things. There's a long way to go, uh, you know, how these socioeconomic factors are influencing brain injury uh, and therapies. But this is the beginning of that journey. But in nutshell, um, these data do suggest uh, hypothermia does not reduce um, the composite outcome of death and disability um, in South Asia. And like I said, the underlying mechanisms is different to high countries, which might explain the lack of neuroprotection um, and, and we need to study this much more. And I often um, um, stop with this slide because I know I'm working with very, very passionate people who always want to do good things. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Sudin. Uh, uh, that was an extensive talk. Uh, I will not, uh, we are just like running behind the time. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll go to Professor Vishnubhar to present his slides, please. Yeah, good evening to everybody. It was nice uh, listening to Sudin. I thought I will not have any time to talk at the end. So let me share my slides. Is it okay? Yes, Hello. sir. You can, see, you can go full screen, sir. I'm just seeing where I have to see full screen. Will I address the question answer at the end after once uh, you know we start the discussions? Where does this full screen come? You can go to slideshow, sir, on the top, or you can go to it. Yeah, either you can go to slideshow or at the bottom, you know, where this 76% is there, let's left button of that. Left side of that, there is a yeah. Is it okay? Uh, no, sir. Uh, I mean there's a there's a tab uh, just left to this 136%. There's a tab. Uh, you just click that on the left side, sir. Is it too big? Uh, no, no, sir. Uh, Is it okay? You can go to slideshow, sir. Go to slideshow. And the uh, on the top, go to slideshow. Uh, so animation slideshow. In the slideshow, you can go. Yeah, on the top, sir. Little no, bit above that. Sir. Above that, sir. Animation slideshow. Yeah, yeah, right, yes. Slideshow okay. and then go to, sir. Uh, from beginning. From the beginning. The very first tab. The left side. Left side, sir. Left, left, left. Yeah, there. Perfect. Okay, that's fine. So, good evening to everybody. Let me talk about. I think it's, of... it's not clicked, sir. I think. Uh, just uh, can you click again from the beginning? Now, in my screen, it is full. Uh, okay, so. Just the start button from the beginning, you can click again. No, I think. Uh... It is just a swap of the display problem. You're seeing the full screen, sir? Yeah, I'm seeing full screen. Shall I stop sharing and try? Yeah, just stop sharing and share again, sir. Is it okay now? Yes, sir. It's fine, sir. Perfect. Okay, so we were uh, working on prenatal asphyxia for a long time. So for more than two decades, initially we were looking at these people, unfortunate infants, what to do for them because the mortality was very high. So we looked at various factors which we predict outcome. Like we looked at their initially Afga score, then we looked at their uh, neurological scoring, we looked at uh, their oxidative stress. We looked at their DNA damage. Various things we looked at. All of them are able to predict the outcome, but 
did not really help the newborns. So then we got interest with the therapeutic hypothermia, thinking that something can be done for these. The most important thing is that therapeutic hypothermia acts at multiple level. It reduces the anaerobic glycosis, it uh, improves the uh, ATP level, it acts on the ND, uh, NMDA level uh, pathways, liposes, peroxidation, nitric oxide uh, mechanism. Finally, all these end up in free radicals in here. There is too much oxidative stress, which causes the brain damage. So I will not go into the mechanism of cooling because all of you are familiar. Basically, there will be an induction phase, maintenance and rewarming. My understanding is that rapid uh, cooling, we usually cool within 45 minutes, one hour. Most of the babies within 45 minutes, we could cool them, then maintain for 72 days. Uh, hours and then gradually rewarm over 8 to 12 hours. But this should be done at within 6 hours because that is the therapeutic window after which you do whatever you do. It really does not help much because by that time irreversible brain damage occurs. And you continue cooling for 72 hours and the temperature is also <coughs> fixed to 33 to 34 degrees and gradual rewarm. So rapid cooling, sustaining maintaining temperature, gradual increase in temperature. So what we used to do is uh, we use the gel packs, which we use for uh, vaccine carrier initially. We cover with the clothes because if it comes in direct contact with the baby skin, it causes injury. So put up the warmer, put a rectal probe, put a skin probe, collect a uh, multi-parameter monitor. Continuously, this monitor will be monitoring the temperature, upper and lower limit, heart rate, respiratory rate, and oxygen such everything will be monitored. And any deviation from the set uh, levels, it will give alarm so that it gives a warning to the people that uh, something has gone wrong. People have to attend uh, immediately. So the first study we did using this uh, gel pack, those days we had only two ventilators. Most of the ventilators were occupied with respiratory distress and acute cases where the mortality was very low and survival was very good. So we could not uh, put hypoxic babies on ventilators. So most of the cases will be moderate and uh, severe cases, but severe cases on ventilator who are shock, who are debilitated already, we never pulled them. Although they were all inborn babies, there was no extramural babies in our any of the studies because most of them did not reach our hospital within six hours. They did, those who come, they did not have their Afghan score or ABG level. Whatever treatment given details were not there. Many of them were in shock or hypothermia. So we did not include any of the extramural babies. So it was so impressive to me, the first study, we could reduce the morbidity and mortality at six months by 21%. As Sudin says, the neurodevelopmental outcome may not be very definite at six months, but definitely you can make uh, the uh, changes you can appreciate. <clears throat> so you look at the, we did the Baroda development screening, the mean score, developmental age, development quotient, the number of uh, babies above, below the 97%, all were different in hypothermia when compared to non-hypothermia or our uh, control group. Even impaired hearing and uh, vision were also less in hypothermia, but it did not reach significance. So we looked at the combined outcome of death and developmental delay at six months, and it was showing significant difference or marked improvement because of cooling. You will be surprised a moderate hypothermia baby will be in a, such a neurological state within 36, 72 hours, he will come out as if he had a good night's nice sleep and uh, smiling at you. So that was the observation what we were making. So number of convulsions were less and number of the anti-convulsion people were also less in the hypothermia group. So I was so impressed by the cooling, although we were doing with the gel pack. So the next DM student came, so I told, why don't you look at the oxidative stress because it may be, I initially, as Sudin says, there could be some 
problem with the data collection all these things but all babies i would have seen my more than 90% of babies i would have seen myself but others were also seen so next uh, group of uh, hypothermia and control we looked at the oxidative stress in the babies so as the oxidative stress increases the antioxidant status comes down and oxidative stress level increases the melan dialdehyde and the mda level increases so at baseline if you see the antioxidant level is almost same there is not much difference between the cooling and uncooled babies but when you come to 72 hours the uncooled uh, baby the oxidative uh, antioxidant status comes down significantly similarly if you look at the melan dialdehyde that goes up in those babies who are not cooled so if you think there's something uh, wrong with the brain before or the oxidative problems are earlier how it will change with cooling and if you look at the neurological deficit at this child there was significant difference of 36% to 70% so risk of developing neurological abnormality at this child was significantly low in cooling and we postulated this oxidative stress is the mechanism probably the cooling reduces the oxidative stress has been found in the study next the, the phd student came so i told why don't you look at the dna damage which we observed in hypoxia babies whether cooling changes it or not what something similar to what uh, our uh, dean uh, sudin was doing with the genetic studies <coughs> so we took the hypothermia and hypothermia babies looked at their dna damage we did what's called as comatose so we separate the blood sample centrifuge alkali denaturation we do then you apply electrophoresis the change the altered the damage dna move will away from the cell nucleus of the cell so it will look like a comet when you do the assessment so as the dna damage is more the head will become smaller less dna in the head tail will become longer so the dna damage will move away from the nucleus and there will be longer time as the damage is more so this is just to show this is a normal cell where the cell is more round there is hardly any tail in the sense the dna is more or less in the cell when the hypoxia comes stage uh, 1 2 3 if you see the tail will be mighty long moderately long very long so by looking at the dna damage we can say that how severe is the asphyxia in the baby so what sudin was showing in the genetic testing it is only the outcome it is not the primary thing that's what i think and we looked at the what is called a micronucleus so in a bilog the nucleus there is something called a micronucleus small nucleus small nucleus uh, the micronucleus presence indicates cell death or apoptosis so more micronucleus you find there is more cell damage or apoptosis occurred there was significantly higher number of micronucleus we count uh, against uh, 100 wbcs and see how many have micronucleus it's significantly more in those babies who are Uh, not cool we looked at even the karyotyping we did the ring chromosome present in the interchromotid uh, the connections dicentric chromosome all were more in those babies who were not cooled when compared to cooled <coughs> so we looked at the tail length of the infants those were cooled and un- uncooled the control at this line if you see the tail length is almost similar whereas in 36 to 72 hours if you see the uncooled one the tail length increases even in 72 hours it is almost double so definitely cooling improves the outcome that i think even helix trial also has seen that now percentage of dna in the tail if you see in the beginning it is almost similar whereas after cooling for 36 and 72 hours you see the difference between the percentage of dna damage dna in the tail it is significantly increased even at 36 hours it's increased so what is happening is that if you do not cool the baby you allow the baby to continue to have damage and you are producing more more 
hypox more hypoxic damage in the baby and if you look at the this is a bar uh, diagram showing the dna damage the blue one is the cold one red one is uncooled one so you look at the this thing it is remains almost same cooling does not prevents the further damage to the cell it does not reverse but it definitely prevents further damage so if you do not cool it continue to have damage so that is the problem which i think sudin should understand so now look at the comet tail length what we did was this uh, study sudin was telling there is no study after 6 months this uh, we have followed up almost 2 years because he was a phd student he could continue to follow them up so 18 to 24 the minimum was 18 months and continued for 2 years we compared the tail length with the mental development score and uh, motor development score so as the tail length increase more and more damage the development score is different if you look at the motor development score also as the damage increases the developmental score comes down so we hypothesize that therapeutic hypothermia reduces oxidative stress and dna damage as shown in these studies and it definitely reduces the neurodevelopment outcome at 18 months and dna damage and oxidative stress are the main mechanism which causes hypoxic damage in the brain and therapeutic hypothermia definitely reduces it whether you do in high income low income middle income or no income provided the case selection is proper if you already pull a damaged uh, baby and do a high flown study and record and analyze all these things you do but basically the infant which you pull makes the difference now we looked at the renal damage we also looked at the outcome the kidney damage we, when you pool and non pool there is a significant difference because there are many papers which have come whether we should reduce the drug dosage when you pool or whether you can give the same doses of the drugs so we were interested in seeing whether what happens to the kidney if you look at the kidney also the damage is different in cold and uncooled babies uncooled babies have almost double the amount of renal damage fortunately most of the cooling uh, kidney damage are mild type the severe ones are not that common we also looked at the myocardial function we es uh, estimated their cpk mb level we had estimated the troponin level we did the ecg and uh, echo with the cardiac this help and with the cold and uncooled if you see there is a significant difference between the cold and uncooled babies <coughs> next we looked at the magnesium sulfate along with the cooling because by this time when sudin so helix trial started we stopped randomizing into non cooled arm because our ethics committee was uh, very unwillingly approved the last study based on sudin study we showed his study one after another and they said it is still unconvinced but after this uh, we have some consciousness so we could not randomize them this i told sudin also we have stopped randomizing to non cooling arm by this time so we <coughs> gave magnesium sulfate to this one group of infants other group we did not give magnesium sulfate both were cooled uh, babies but when you assess the neuro development outcome at uh, one year although it may not be that much reliable they were slightly better when compared to the only cooling with magnesium sulfate it was better but the problem was some of them were going to respiratory depression severe sedation and some of them have to be put on ventilator this is one of the problems when you give magnesium sulfate you may ask me don't you find any side effects but unlike helix trial our uh, morbidity rate was very very low maybe half of what they have seen so he was looking at uh, the death or mortality but i think they should have looked at the morbidity and should have tried to see why the morbidity is so high in helix trial and uh, probably they should have stopped in between and checked what happened which we they do not do so the sinus bradycardia and uh, skin changes are the Uh, major problems which uh, uh, 
saw and skin changes were seen mostly when we are doing the with the gel patch but with the face changing materials there was not much a difference then we compared the complication between the cooled and uncooled baby it is almost similar except the sinus bradycardia if a cold baby does not have bradycardia that means he is not cooled if he has got tachycardia most probably has got infection or shock or some problem is there he needs attention this you must remember <clears throat> so there are uh, the systematic reviews also which showed which you all must have read the um, jacobeto which showed their benefits of cooling and also another from uh, low income countries where abet et al has done they showed that there is significant improvement in brain damage or neurodevelopment outcome when you do cooling so that is the issue so then we compared our uh, data or uh, outcome with neuro mortality and neurodevelopment outcome with the helix trial and also the study which he was uh, mentioning in calicut except these studies the mortality was low in all our studies and if you look at the neurodevelopmental outcome which was not done in that calicut study whereas in helix trial also the neurodevelopmental outcome is better so does hole so then and madam sita shankar trying to say that whatever little benefit the cool babies will get should not get or i don't know what is the concept is now look at uh, should we cool hype uh, babies in our low middle income countries or not what sudin was putting so my suggestion is that you should offer cooling to all infants if they come within 6 hours they should have severe uh, significant acidosis and also moderate to severe encephalopathy what he was telling us mild encephalopathy we should not do definitely because it is labor intensive and you may cause the complications so moderate and severe encephalopathy i think with the neonatology in trained person in the unit it should not be difficult to find whether a child has moderate to severe of course it may be difficult sometimes but it is not and if you look at the helix trial they had lot of um, proportion of the infants had brain damage as he showed in the mri and also convulsion and uh, sudin with lot of experience must be knowing convulsion does not occur very early in hypoxic babies it occurs after 6 8 hours so if you wait for convulsions most of the time is bad i think what a major problem happened is they did not have details of resuscitation they did not have how they were transferred many of them had hypothermia and more than 70% are outborn that is why he is seeing such a bad outcome with this thing, which he should be able to understand and it is not the dna in the brain or the other thing we have lower birth weight we have uh, more infection maybe but they are not the major issues as i can see and i say that you should not do cooling everywhere you should have proper setup you should have neonatologist you should have round the clock monitoring you should have radiant warmer you should have proper cooling device if you have a servo control cooling device that is the best but it is not affordable in many centers that is the problem and our experience with the servo control what our sudin has given for a short period and also face change material there is not much of difference provided your nursing care and doctors are good you should have a good multi para monitor you should have facility for mechanical ventilator so it should be a good intensive care where you can do cooling cooling should not be done in a peripheral level and also choosing the patient is important you should come within 6 hours and you should have a proper protocol for cooling if you indiscriminately cooling within 6 hours babies who are hypoxiated at birth not resuscitated properly transferred in a poor condition definitely helix trial will get repeated in the sense it will not show any improvement so my take home message to in the short time given to me is perinatal asphyxia is a very important problem so our aim is not to treat perinatal asphyxia we should spend more money on improving the infrastructure looking at the high risk pregnancies 
giving them adequate uh, uh, proper management delivery proper resuscitation and facility for transfer into a center where they have high facility and in the proper condition otherwise hyperthermia or hypothermia as rightly said by sudin will cause more damage so therapeutic hypothermia with or without adjuvant therapy can reduce mortality and long term outcome i have no doubt i have 100% sure about what i am talking and what has happened in the helix trial i think sudin himself must be knowing but he is not telling the truth that's what i think so in here i'll close here i uh, want to thank all those people involved in my group most of them were dm students phd students and other department people thank you for uh, hearing and if there is any questions we will answer it then thank you thank you professor but uh, excellent uh, excellent talk uh, i think after this uh, both the excellent session i will welcome uh, dr suman uh, to uh, do the further proceeding and uh, do the moderate uh, moderate the panel discussion and further question and answer session over to you madam uh, thank you very much and it's indeed my privilege and honor to uh, moderate this session and definitely to cool or not it's such a hot topic and that's what we are going to be discussing now and uh, uh, please tell me if you're able to see my screen right yes you can see the screen and you can go full screen okay can you see full screen yeah but it's in the presenter view can you swap uh, use slide show the top button yeah yeah then i will do the slide show yeah okay so now we are going to be looking at therapeutic hypothermia you heard two sides of the story done in the same place and therefore now i think it has thrown people into confusion how should i cool or not and that's the big question that we are going to be asking today um so we are going to be discussing the controversies but try to arrive at a consensus so that we have the way forward uh, so how we are doing this panel is first we'll have a, a two rounds of questions to our eminent panelists and then we have there are so many questions in by the audience so dr arvanan will take up all those questions and hopefully at the end of this panel we hope that people do know some sort of guidance of what we should do with our babies because perinatal asphyxia is one of the three big pillars in um, low and middle income countries and we need to have a solution to what we could do so now let's put therapeutic hypothermia under the scanner and i start with professor sita shankaran who started all this you have been working in this field for i think decades now so when you saw the results of the helix trial why did you think what's the impact in low and middle income countries different from high income countries i know we have heard professor uh, sudeen already talking about it but we would like to hear from you why did you think it's so different in lmics over to you professor sita madam you're mute yeah we can't hear you ma'am please tell um yeah ma'am you are unmuted but we can't hear you we need to check whether she joined with the computer audio or I can see her audio is joined. Still not able to hear. Some disturbance from your end. Now. Maybe the earphone problem. Because I think I think the volume is less.
Maybe we could move to the second question and she could yeah. log out and come yes. back. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, we can move. Ma'am, if you have another device, please try with another device. Okay, so I think then come back. we were very keen to start our panel with uh, with Dr. Sita's first comments, but I think we'll have to. Oh, probably we are hearing our own echo through her system. I think Madam is trying to talk, but it is not clear. Okay, so in the interest of time, I would like to maybe move to the second question to the second panelist. And uh, Dr. Dinesh, you are uh, you are sort of representing all the neonatologists in uh, from India. So why do you think the results of Helix are different in LMICs? And then maybe you can share your experience about therapeutic hypothermia because I know that you are also have been doing this with uh, some good results. Yeah. Uh, we can't hear you, Dr. Dinesh. So you have to yeah, that, can, am I audible now? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Thanks, thanks, Simon, for posing that question. And uh, thank you, Dr. Sudhir and Dr. Vishnu for excellent lecture uh, presentations. And, and it's very important for us to come to consensus about what is good for the country and what is good for the babies. Uh, Dr. Sudhir, I think after getting trained and coming back to the country, we all believe that we should give best to our babies. And uh, I think there are very few interventions in medicine which are very um, uh, country-wise dependent and uh, uh, like I feel as a pediatric intensivist where the way we give fluid uh, bolus is a septic shock. Um, it's a little bit, you know, you don't give very fast like the way you give in septic shock in Western countries. But when it comes to cooling, the physiology about the way it's neuroprotective seems to be quite uh, clear. So cooling as a therapy seems to be quite protective. So we, we all are, seems to be convinced. And then we sort of looked at the genetic part of it. We don't know whether the genetic changes are because of the mode of the injury. Is it acute injury versus you know, prolonged injury? Rather than sort of, you know, the genetic basis of the people who are living. And India, as you know, is a very heterogeneous population and healthcare services. 70% of the services in India still are private sector, 30% is public sector. Public sector is quite overburdened and it can time be quite stressful. I have been trained in one of, some of, the, uh, one of the centers and sometimes in one, one, one sort of warmer, we might have to take care of two or three babies also. So to the understand the difference between NIMS, we need to know what was the cause of the increased mortality, both in the control group and this almost going to 50%. When, when we actually looked at the number of uh, severe encephalopathy, only 20, 20% in each group, and 80, 80% were moderate encephalopathy. So that is the first thing is to understand the difference between the high mortality in the NICU is one thing. So will that be sort of generalized to the whole of the LMICs? Then when it comes to acute versus chronic asphyxia, we need to probably stress more about the antenatal and intrapartum monitoring, which is very important for us as a neonatologist to probably take our obstetricians into consideration to be more neuroprotective rather than dismissing the therapy completely. Now, the significant number of patients have been from the outbound. And the outbounds, and one of the big challenge, and this we were discussing today, is the mode of transport. A structured transport is what which makes a big difference. So many of the babies who come, if they're hypothermic, it itself is a poor prognostic factor when it comes to outcome of this baby. And of course, when do you start cooling? See, the, in, 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 in India, where you know, busy, I know when you are asphyxiated, by the time you counsel them, you tell them you need to move to other hospital, they organize an ambulance, they come to busy places like Mumbai, Bangalore, Chennai, they take good sort of three, four hours, and then they come to the hospital, you, you counsel them, you take through, this takes time. So initiating within the first six hours is a big challenge. And one thing which is very important, I really appreciate for sort of highlighting is, it had become that cooling is a norm. And if you cool the baby, that's fixed, it, so it's enough. I think cooling is one modality of neuroprotection. You need to optimize other things like taking care of their uh, ventilation, optimizing it, 
taking care of the hemodynamics and optimizing it, prevention of or treating the infection, sedation as and when required for the baby sedation, and neuromonitoring of these babies, monitoring the doing a cardiac evaluation for them, looking for any sort of you know coagulopathy for them. These are all part of NICU care of these babies, which is very important. And this is something which has nicely been highlighted by Helix trying to say, just cooling is not enough. It is the overall ICU care which is going to make a big difference. Now, after the Helix, it became very important for us to say, yes, let us look at our data because I never thought we could do an RCT of cooling. So we just started cooling way back from 2012 in our unit. So we now, at as a rainbow, we have sort of 12 centers across the country, but uh, we, I collected data from four of our centers, which are the high volume centers, and also from two other units, and this was one of the survey which was done by uh, Manigandan, which looked at which are the availability of cooling machines and who are doing, and they found that uh, uh, mature to the private hospital, they're still doing in the sort of cooling uh, compared to the public. Okay. Can I go to the next slide? So to show my sort of uh, these things. So this is from the unit which I'm working, and we use Stechotherm, and we use some babies critical which they had kept for a demo purpose. So total 88 babies we had cooled. Total 23 are inborn and 65 are outborn. Or 45 babies we wet ourselves and transported with a doctor and nurse. So doctors were either fellows or a consultant. And a self-transport 20 had come. Moderate were 16, severe were 7. And 51 had a, a moderate HI in the outborn and 14 were severe. Mortality, 68 out of 88 got discharged. 13 went Lama, 6 in stage 2. A seven inch so moderate six went lama seven in the, because the lama cause could be could you assure that this child is going to normal or not six expired that is intention to treat but if you say 21.5 percent of the babies if you say lama and the expired we include so we had sort of 21.5 percent of mortality then we i then we start let us look at other units how we are doing and then we included the data uh from other centers of our uh, four centers in Delhi, um, the Bangalore unit, uh, and the Vijaywada unit. And Dinanath Mangeshkar Pune and SRMC Medical College Chennai, who have been cooling for a long time. So there are 200, 324 babies we have included. And these are the units which have been regularly cooling. 131 were inborn and 193 outborn, so nearly 60% were outborn. Out of this, 102 were transported by newborn emergency transport. So 50%, above 50% were transport. 260 moderate and 64 were severe, which is just about 20% had severe encephalopathy. Servo control cooling was used in 244 of, out of the 324 of the babies. If you look at moderate stage, out of 105, 104 survived. Out of Severe, 26 babies, 12 survived uh, uh, in the uh, inborn patients, and the four, uh, 11 expired and three went lama. In the outborn category, out of the 155 babies, 138 sort of, uh, were discharged, and three expired and 14 went lama. In the severe category, 18 survived and 10 went expired and 10 went lama. So severe encephalopathy was definitely poor prognostic marker. So there was nearly 19.17. Then I looked at our Banjara unit specifically to look at some of the markers. So section rate, I think, as you pointed out in your presentation, yes, in, in, sometimes there's a more of high risk pregnancy come to the unit. So we had uh, probably a little bit, a uh, uh, little less than 50% had section. Uh, a lot of them were emergency sections because sort of, uh, you know, uh, a sentinel event or uh, we had, Male to female ratio were in 31 and 57. The umbilical blood gas was available in all the 23 inborn babies. So that's the norm in our unit to do the blood gas for all the inborns. But 20 out of 65 outborns had umbilical blood gas. So some of them were the other peripheral units of our hospital in the Hyderabad clusters. They had to have been sent. EEG was done in 74 out of the 88 patients. And clinical seizures were present in 64 out of 88 patients. Such compressions were given in 20 out of the 88. Positive pressure and intubation was done in 40 patients and just a PPV in 18 patient. Respiratory support was given to 87.5% of the, this uh, 
children, in, uh, new babies, including H O four ventilation. When it came to Banjara, when I just said, okay, let me, let, I was just looking at one of the fifty-seven percent of our severe encephalopathy baby died. It been born or outborn, and when we look at the overall data from all the six centers, similarly, more than fifty percent of our severe encephalopathy baby died. So what? It, I, I say it is optimization of your NICU care which is going to be there. We are collecting our data about their uh, 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 developmental outcome at 18 months in these things. I think we, we uh, you know, I'm not able to present that, but I think disability, the, the reason to present the mortality is one of the striking thing was it increases the mortality was one of the concerns raised. And that is what was my you know, major thing to share our data. And we would really like to know, you know, the reduction in the mortality is be more to optimizing of the NICU care um, rather than cooling only is what I have to say. Thanks, thanks, Dinesh. Thank you very much uh, um, for highlighting one very, very important aspect is that it is the quality of comprehensive NICU care and not just about cooling, which, which will probably have an effect on outcomes. Uh, and of course, people might say this data from Rainbow is what Dr. Sudin has already told us that you're at the peak of the pyramid, right up there, and we all know that. Um, but I think uh, what Helix really did was made us all go back and look at our own data. We have also looked at data from St. John's because we have been cooling for a decade now. And just like you showed, our outborn mortality was almost double that of inborn mortality. Our inborn mortality was less than 10%. And, but our outbound mortality was less than half of what was there in uh, Helix. And St. John's is somewhere midway, I would say. It's not a corporate sector, but it's not like a public hospital either. And therefore, I think uh, focusing on quality of care, like you said, um, in fact, not only have you presented data, but you have also sort of shown us how it can be made safer by talking about the retrieval of babies and not just about self-transport and such things. So thanks, Dinesh. Thank you very much. And I hope we can go back to uh, Professor Sita Shankaran. Uh, I hope, Madam, that uh, we'll be able to hear you now to know your expert comments on, on why um, Helix did not seem to have an impact in LMICs. Over to you, Professor Sita Shankaran. Okay, ma'am. Can you try one more time? Uh, so, Looks like I think the technical issue is still there. So I've just devised a option of connecting to my mobile. Yeah. So, and we'll just put her on uh, the speaker from my side. Uh, Professor Sita, can you pick up your phone? Uh, just pick up your phone and then uh, we can connect you from on the phone. Uh, hello, ma'am. Yes. One second. One sec. Okay, go ahead. Be going. Can you speak, ma'am? Ma'am, you will have to watch. One second. Can you hear now? Yeah. Yeah, I don't understand why they will not One sec, I think that it's echoing at my end, so this may not work. Kiran, can you mute your speaker, not the, yeah, mic, yeah. the speaker? No, well, I, I'm trying to play her on my speaker. No, so no, that's, that's fine, but you you can mute your speaker, not the uh, yeah. not the mic. You can't hear, but we can hear. So just go ahead, mute One your second. speaker. Okay. Okay, ma'am, can you speak? I think the audio is not loud. Yeah. Can you hear me now? There is a lot of echoing, I think. Some... 
Maybe she needs to mute her speaker as well. I have muted my speaker. Make on the speaker. I think we'll have to come back yeah. to you, ma'am. Uh, looks like uh, uh, this is not also working. Yeah. We'll come back to you, ma'am, with the next question. Yeah, I was it. wondering, uh, uh, Dr. Kiran, if you yeah. unmute yourself, put her on speaker on your phone and, and we mute uh, That's what, her video, would that work? That's what I was doing, actually, but still there is echo. Okay. Oh, I'm sure that we'll be very, very disappointed if we can't hear Professor Sita. So let's see how before we close this panel, we are able to uh, hear her, but we will move forward now. Uh, so we will go to uh, Dr. Isma Jaha, who is actually representing all the investigators of the Helix trial. What was your experience of uh, doing the, this large trial, Helix? Over to you, Dr. Isma. Am I audible? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank, uh, you so thank you so much, much the organizers. Organizer. Is it okay? okay? My sound? Uh, it's fine. There was some echo earlier, but it's fine now. Okay. I really enjoyed the uh, power presentations uh, last uh, um, uh, hour and uh, um, I have been a part of Helix trial since it's uh, big starting in Dhaka BSMMU. Uh, so it was nice journey. So uh, from investigators perspective, uh, let me share the uh, cooling therapy, uh, cooling therapy uh, scenario in Dhaka. So till now, uh, no unit hospital, center, or institution practice uh, cooling therapy in Bangladesh. So we are the first uh, started uh, the uh, cooling therapy uh, as a part of Helix trial. Uh, so uh, since its beginning, uh, we were uh, full of enthusiasm and we were also hoping uh, that uh, this magical treatment therapy uh, would work for our babies and uh, this machine will be available for our babies and there will be something for our HIV babies. So it did not work. Uh, and uh, the thing is uh, what I understood or what Helix taught me uh, that we probably uh, spending more time and effort uh, for proving efficacy of an intervention. Uh, rather than focusing on the evaluation of our unique characteristics, LMIC characteristics. Uh, so I'm talking about uh, the factors uh, before birth, socio-demographic factors, uh, antenatal perspective of fetal well-being, uh, timing uh, of injury, pathophysiology and, uh, of HA babies in this part of world. So uh, what we understood from uh, different uh, presentations that these something unique uh, must be there uh, in our babies. Uh, so my point of view is uh, we should rather focus on exploring this uninvestigated, unevaluated area uh, rather than uh, focusing on uh, proving an intervention. So intervention is far, um, uh, far away from our uh, situation. And uh, I must thank to all these uh, trial team, LMIC trial team, because for them, uh, we um, are aware of our unique characteristics. Uh, we are now uh, getting uh, discussions and all that conflicting results and controversies. So thanks to all trial team uh, for uh, giving us this opportunity that uh, uh, they warn and remind, Helix remind us uh, that any trial or any experimental intervention would not work if we uh, do not know our patient populations, patient characteristics. 
so that is all from my side i'm sorry i have no slide to show um, so over to you, over to dr shumon rao thanks thank you so much dr isma uh, ismat i don't think you have to be sorry we are so glad that you could come in at you know the nth minute when professor shahidullah had uh, suddenly other commitments and you so rightly said that first we should know our population before we think of really going into an intervention that's so so true that um, we we should do our best to make sure that our babies come out well and prevent asphyxia and only then think of understanding them think of uh, cooling i think but bangladesh is in a situation where you have no controversy you haven't yet embarked on cooling and yours was the only yes. place to start this trial and now you're very clear that probably it's not going to move forward in bangladesh but i think in india and in other places the situation is a little different because we have moved quite forward on this path and that is where we have this uh, thing so we are let me now go and ask dr shridhar kalyana sundaram um what is the current practice in the middle eastern countries and do you think this data from helix will change your practice in any way evening everyone uh, thank you uh, kiran and dr suman and the team for this opportunity to be with this august panel i'd like to congratulate uh, sudeen and uh, professor but for uh, the excellent talks and interesting perspectives we may say and of course there is always uh, different perceptions when it comes to differing views and perspectives so we have to understand both the uh, arguments for and against and uh, have a unbiased approach uh, that's my view in terms of the middle east i mean very interesting uh, scene that we have uh, tertiary centers and we have the level 2 centers not everyone will have the cooling facilities and rightly as explained earlier that level 3 centers will be the ones who cool the babies and the geographically it's not very big so we have in united arab emirates for example we have seven emirates which you have the option to heli transfer or road transfer and within one to two hours traffic is usually not a major issue and the uh, issue we have is that the art stick medico legally that is applied here is similar to western criteria so they are not going to go by population statistics whether the, and it's a huge uh, variation multi ethnic uh, expert population here so if you say genetic variations are going to impact will we be cooling the patients who come from us or uk but not the ones from india or sri lanka it's very unlikely that would be acceptable in a scenario like this and uh we know from all over the place i mean the perspectives on the genetic part is very interesting and uh, both dr bat and uh, professor sudin had these views but the key thing is we know that population does play a role in diabetes for example in hypertension for example uh, and there are multiple studies or uh, long term studies which have been done in a chinese population moving to us or in the framingham study the uh, and even barker's hypothesis they say that the people from a certain background have a higher risk but that doesn't mean that you would not use a certain measure totally in them and one point i would like to make regarding the population number or the apex institute numbers i mean if you look at the population of india of 1.2 billion even 15 to 20% caters to medium to high risk uh, groups you have good facilities it's going to be almost equal to the population of us and four or five times the population of uk so we are talking of huge numbers when you talk of a big country like india and as you said we have come fairly advanced as far as the middle eastern experience is concerned there are a few publications and especially from saudi arabia where they have uh, applied in saudi arabia as well the government setups are comparable to the western setups and so the studies have come from them they do have a similar uh, transfer policy for the sicker babies who are delivered in centers who don't have cooling they will be transferred and the expectation is there from the authorities here that we should go by the western standard so if you don't cool babies you may be in trouble if they fill i mean fill fulfill the criteria so medical legally we have an obligation uh, i was uh, looking at the mac cool study where uh, qatar was involved as well and egypt and saudi arabia were among the other centers in addition to canada similar to professor butts uh, talk on i mean the brief mention on the magnesium sulfate in cooling and they also showed comparable results but it was a pilot study and i have to follow up whether they are doing a long term study so this is the published evidence but uh, as i am working in a tertiary center and many of my colleagues are working in the government institutes which are tertiary centers the outcome we have that we have observed we don't have very solid papers on this but the outcomes we are observing is comparable to any of the western data 
and uh, population background, the obstetric care, these are going to make a very big impact. So I'll be discussing it in the next point that we will discuss as well about uh, selection, patient selection. So with this, I'll close this part of the talk. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Sridhar. Thank you so much uh, for highlighting that, you know, just like in front of law and justice, all are equal. Similarly, you can't really make a difference and say you're from US, you're from India, I'm going to cool you, I'm not going to cool you, your genes may be different. So for highlighting that, and also you're going to elaborate on the population. So uh, you also highlighted about the medical legal aspects, which are so strong in the Middle Eastern countries. Uh, I do see that some of the participants are raising their hand. Um, uh, please bear with us. We will be having a full session on question and answers. And uh, uh, so we will have enough opportunity for that. Now, so let's, let's go try. forward. Uh, Dr. Suman, should we try again? Uh, uh, so shall we? Yeah, yeah. I, I just we tried logging off. I, and on. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to, you know, we had a question from Professor Sudin about the DSMB interim analysis. You've actually already answered it. And there are a host of other questions waiting for you in the question and answer session. So if you don't mind, we'll skip this. We will try another time with Professor Sita. Over to you, Professor Sita. Un unmute, please, now. Unmute, yeah. Uh, you're still muted. Please unmute yourself. I think we're on. OK. Can you say? OK. Perfect. Is it working? Yes. yes. Very oh, well. OK. Thank you. <laughs> Thank Finally. you. Thank you. I apologize for, um, you know, all the uh, audiovisual problems and uh, I have to say we've had some very interesting presentations, a lot of uh, very interesting data that's been presented. Um, so um, I will try and answer any questions that you have. Um, so Professor Sita, our question to you was, um, you have been working for you know, almost two decades only in this, and you have seen how it has changed practice all over the world. Now, when the results of the helix came out, what were your impressions of why it is not working in LMICs? Well, the, the, the first thing was that, um, you know, the population, there is a difference in the population between the infants enrolled in helix and the infants in the um, high income countries, mainly looking at the infants in helix really had a very uh, early onset of seizures. So that is different from, from the infants that we have seen in the NICHD trials. That was one thing. Um, the other thing was um, in our very first trial, um, as was pointed out by Sudan, um, we did, you know, we realized only when the trial was over that we had elevated temperature in the control group. So you have to remember this is 1998. Um, you know, to 2003. So uh, we didn't realize because actually, if you if you look at a normal newborn nursery, nobody really monitors temperature so closely on infants. And we realized only after the trial was over that the infants in the control group had elevated temperatures. So, and we've published on that and we have another paper coming out now on uh, blanket temperatures among these infants. So, um, Having elevated temperature in the control group in the May, in the in the um, uh, cool cap trial and the um, and the NICHD trial um, is different from the Helix trial where it was very carefully controlled um, in the control group. Um, and I will say in the current NICHD trials, we are doing a trial now on preterm infants we do control the temperature in the control group. And as was pointed out in the uh, adult and pediatric trials, the large ones that have just been published, uh, temperature control in the uh, control group is, is a big focus. So that was another difference between the, the, the Helix trial and the FIRE trials. Um, you know, and, and um, one question that I had uh, uh, among the um, data that's been presented, and it's a lot of data, it's hard to you know, simulate everything, is the 
patient selection. So you have to see that in both in the helix, the helix trial followed the NICHD criteria for patient selection. So the infants had to be severely acidotic or need resuscitation at birth. Um, they had to have a moderate or severe encephalopathy by certified examiners, you know, within, within six hours of age. So, and all other causes of uh, encephalopathy were excluded. So that was also um, another, you know, major thing with Helix that I think um, strengthened the, that, the, the Helix trial. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, madam. You have highlighted that probably the patient population was different. There was higher hyperthermia in the NACI, in ICHD, mm -hmm. which may have shown a larger difference between the cool group and the non-cool group. And um, also that patient selection was very similar to the NICHD uh, trial. And therefore, maybe it's the population which is different, uh, which could have uh, affected the impact. So we, we move forward. Thank you very much for your uh, words. And then le let me share screen again. Um, so we now move to Professor uh, uh, Vishnu Bhatt. Um, so you have done almost, I think, six uh, trials, randomized control trials. And I remember when we read your first randomized control trial, and then subsequently more, many more came out. Why is Professor Vishnu Bhatt still continuing with randomized control trials and not you know, using it as a standard of therapy. So what took you so many trials to decide, yes, fine, now it should be the standard of care in Chipma? Yeah, this is a good question. I wanted to convince myself and others that it is really working. What happened was the results were so excellent or extraordinary. Sometimes uh, if anything has gone wrong, why we could get such good results? Although I was seeing most of the babies myself, but we wanted to 100% uh, sure about what we are talking about. So we looked at the oxidative stress, we looked at the DNA damage, very suspect whether cooling has any benefit or not. Otherwise, it may be by chance, as the screen or other people are telling, uh, the brain is already damaged or uh, the problem is there. That way of thinking, whether cooling is effective or it is uh, by chance it is getting. So you looked at the oxidative stress, there is significant fall uh, with the choline. We looked at the DNA damage, the DNA damage halted when uh, we continued cooling. So there was uh, definitely better outcome. And all over the country, we would have conducted more than uh, 50 workshops, training hundreds of uh, pediatricians. And all of them are, many of them are doing cooling. And many of them come to our center. They were working for uh, 10 to 15 days to learn the technique. And then they go back and do cooling. So till people are convinced, I, uh, I wanted to show what I was talking about. Is it by chance or is it really there? So like uh, our Sudin also looked at the uh, changes in the uh, DNA. So these are the changes occurring because of stress. It is not because they are already damaged inside the uterus. It may be inside the uterus when there is an obstructed labor, when there is a cord around the neck, some problem intrauterine, it can happen. Otherwise, it, yeah, definitely it is not uh, completely genetic. There will be genetic difference between white, uh, black, uh, east, uh, west, all those things. But I think that is negligible. Therapeutic hypothermia is 100% effective. Definitely, it is if anybody comes, says it should not be done. We are doing harm to the um, infants. That is what my I my thinking. But uh, always you can question. Thank you, sir. Thank you, and we are very very grateful that you have actually brought out such large data on a randomized control trial on this because many of us I know have jumped onto the bandwagon one decade earlier and started cooling without data from India. So your, your data has really a lot of precious value for all of us. And you want it to be, I think, uh, you know, doubly or triply sure before you used it as standard of therapy. Uh, but we also need to remember that you have cooled inborn babies, whereas Helix was, you know, the large chunk was outborn babies. And that is where probably the difference could be. And we may have to really focus on uh, what we have to do for outborn. So now let's move forward on the panel. 
Uh, so we have controversy. We have one large trial, very well conducted trial, which shows that it is not only, it is not beneficial. Let's remember the primary outcome did not show a difference between the two groups. That is survival free of disability at 18 months was similar in the helix trial between the two groups. Mortality was higher. But on the other hand, we have considerable number of data from premier institutes, well-conducted trial, which have shown that it is beneficial. So now what is the way forward? And we have to give our listeners some sort of consensus statement. And with that, I come back to Professor Sita. The big burden of, of uh, uh, asphyxia is in the low and middle income countries. So now what is the next step for them? I mean, we can't sit and say, cooling is not effective. What can we do? So should we still think of having more studies? What is the way forward in Southeast Asian and Sub-Saharan Africa? The other question is when we show this data and you also show data of uh, Professor Sudin showed that from uh, low socioeconomic status, it might be not really um, you know, helpful. So is sort of helix widening the quality and equity uh, chasm, which is already there in low and middle income countries? Over to you, Professor Sita. Um, I think one thing has to be understood, and that is the Helix trial is the only trial that was powered to look at death or disability. The only trial conducted in the LMICs that was powered to, to evaluate death or disabilities. So that is an extremely important um, uh, finding from individuals who do clinical trials. And, you know, and I have a lot of ex experience with clinical trials. So you always power your trial based on your, um, your, your primary outcome, not on secondary outcomes. So the results of the trial did show that when you, when you have targeted normothermia versus uh, targeted hypothermia, there was no benefit of uh, targeted hypothermia in uh, reducing death or disability. That, so that's something very important that one should keep in mind. The trial, um, as was pointed out, was evaluated by a totally independent data safety monitoring committee that was um, unaware as, what, as to what the two groups were. The data they saw was group X versus group Y. And so they saw the data during each of the interim analyses. Um, and they, they had the um, responsibility to monitor the trial and also to decide um, when to stop for either benefit or for adverse events. And that was their responsibility. And that's what they evaluated. So I think we need to, we need to put that in perspective. Um, really, because I do want to emphasize Helix is the only large trial conducted in the low and middle income countries with a primary outcome, with a, a population that is generalizable, because it included, as you pointed out, both inborn babies and outborn babies, and it included the, the spectrum of institutions that could take care of um, of these infants. Now, coming to you know, what is our way forward? Um, as was pointed out by many of the speakers, trying to improve prenatal care um, and improve the, the um, uh, obstetric approach, I think is extremely important. Maternal disease, that is extremely important. Um, and I think we will learn a lot from the PREVENT study that is ongoing, um, that is looking at neonatal encephalopathy and what can be done uh, to prevent that. Um, the, the other thing that I think we all should know is to uh, monitor any infant who's born with a low APCA score or with birth acidosis carefully for, um, you know, for elevated temperatures to monitor them carefully. Um, and I think uh, the big question is, can we use non-pharmacological, I mean, can we use pharmacological therapies for these infants in LMIC? Uh, I think we need to wait for the results of the HEAL trial that will come out, which is erythropoietin, 
and also to wait for the results of the trial that is being conducted in the LMICs with erythropoietin. So, the, so it's going to be a combined approach. It's going to be you know, looking at, at uh, obstetric care, um, looking at neonatal care. Um, mention was made about maternal transport. I think that's, that's a very important uh, factor, transporting high-risk mothers to perinatal centers, as has been mentioned. Um, continuing the good care that's being given in the inborn centers by all the presenters. Um, and then, you know, then let's see, is there, is there something else that we can use um, that has been studied in a large scale uh, setting that might help? So it might be, it might be the, um, you know, erythropoietin or davipoietin might be magnesium sulfate. I think we have to wait on that. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Sita. Um, you have highlighted two major aspects and we know from uh, um, the um, newborn survival series that focusing on for care at birth and on the mother probably has the highest evidence. And also you talked about newer pharmacological therapy that we need to wait for. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. um, but you also, I mean, we also noticed that you did not talk about looking at cooling again in these settings at all. So that's another point that we noted, but we'll move forward now. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. And uh, um, this is a question um, I would like to ask Professor Sudin. Now, you have led this large trial um, in Helix. Now, would this results of this change of practice in the UK, for example, when a baby comes in with seizures at, say, you know, two hours or so, or a baby comes in who is from the Southeast Asian origin, and has uh, signs of like seizures or maybe hypothermia on admission. Are you going to decide that you will not cool these babies based on Helix? Over to you, Professor Sudin. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a very interesting question, Suman. I think, you know, in Helix trial, we did not recruit babies from the UK. So the recruitment was from only from India, um, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. So it's difficult to extrapolate, but you make a very important point. And so did uh, Professor Vishnu Bhatt. What do we do with these babies who have seizures occurring within a couple of hours of birth? We don't see that often in the UK, uh, but there are some, and I suspect in those cases, um, you know, cooling is not going to work. Uh, and that's where we are. So we are at the moment we are trying a um, couple of drug therapies. We initially tried xenone, we didn't work. Um, now we are trying erythropoietin and davipoietin. Uh, we'll see how. But uh, you know, this is a, what happens when to these babies um, who are fitting within a couple of hours. And I'm quite interested to know from Professor Vishnu, but because in your studies, um, especially in the Ghana paper and Tan Lincoln, they are almost 80% had seizures within you know, randomization. So how, um, so how did you find these babies? Did you think um, you know, cooling was still effective? Because in the UK, we don't find that. And the, all the data from high countries it's, it shows if you, if babies fit that early, injuries are occurring earlier and you know, your window for cooling is closed. So cooling doesn't work. So what, what is, uh, you know, I want like to know Professor Vishnu Bhatt's view on that when you had such a high incidence of early onset seizures in your population. You mean to say early convulsions or convulsion during cooling? No, early convulsions at the time of randomization. So the Ghana paper and Tanling, Tani Galasam both of them, you know, 81 and 83 percent had seizures um, at the time of randomization. So, no, was cooling still effective? Mistaken. They did not have convulsion at that moment. They had convulsion during the cooling. See, the, there are two different. In the paper, it says that randomization, those infants had uh, seizures. Yeah, yeah, they did have uh, convulsions, but not at the beginning. In the process, they did have convulsions. Many of them. So you were yeah, so uh, randomization was done within, within six hours. When did you randomize them? Look at the conversion for randomization. Some might have had, but definitely not as much as you found. You found almost eighty percent having conversions. So this yeah. shows the uh, already severe brain damage has occurred before you started cooling. So these babies, what I'm trying to say is that they were not resuscitated properly because we don't have data. They don't have an ABG. They don't know how they were transferred. So what I'm trying to say is that these babies which you have cooled, most of them are already damaged. Mm. 
So the seventy percent. You're absolutely right. Power. Absolutely right. Yeah. So yeah, that so is the problem. It is not the genetic. It is the the care which is given. Yeah. Which has to improve. Okay. Which Madam Sita Sankaran was telling, the care has to improve. Antenatal care has to improve. Proper delivery should be done. Proper transport should be done. Because temperature uh, before cooling is also important. Their hypothermia, their hypothermia, both will cause damage. Since ours are all inborn babies, they were uh, controlled the temperature transfer. We did not find any hypo or hypothermia as such because the temperature was controlled right from the birth. Um, yeah, I'm referring to the papers by Gane and Tan. Uh, uh, I think maybe we can move on because uh, discussing individual papers now may not be in the interest of time. Uh, we agree. I think we. I, I don't think there's anyone who will disagree when we say quality of care at birth during transport all has to be improved. If you if you want better outcomes with or without cooling, I think that is beyond any uh, discussion. And and I hope that your prevent study will also show us how this can be done and we can scale it up very rapidly. Um, but I guess that you know when something is standard practice in the UK, you may not be able to make any changes based on other studies in LMICs. We understand that. But when I actually first read about the helix, what came to my mind was uh, the act and action controversy with you know with people who are familiar with, because I have been closely associated with the action trial. We know that the act trial, which showed in a cluster of randomized control trial, antenatal corticosteroids when it was scaled up and where the entry into the uh, you know, enrollment was not very rigid, it actually showed harm. And then it took WHO to bring about criteria for antenatal corticosteroids and say, you have to be in imminent labor, you have to have the quality of care. And the action trial, which came out last year in NEJM has shown very clearly that it works. So my question was uh, to Dr. Isma Jaha was, uh, like Bangladesh is in a state where you're not considering cooling at all. But if you were going to do another trial on therapeutic hypothermia, would you choose your patient population differently? Over to you, Dr. Ismat. Thank you. Uh, so my big answer will be uh, yes. First, I look into the population characteristics and all the pathophysiologic and other factors that might relate it to uh, pathophysiology of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, then I'll think about intervention, uh, whether it works or not. Yeah. Um, thank you, Dr. Ismat. Uh, and I think now we have some sort of way forward, which uh, Dr. Kiran Mori will discuss. And uh, this is the NNF position statement on therapeutic hypothermia in India. Over to you, Dr. Kiran. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Suman. I know we are running behind the time, so I will not take a lot of time. But basically, the whole purpose of this webinar was to come up with some consensus and way forward. Already, I think we heard and from Dr. Professor Sita and everyone else, you know, what needs to be done. Uh, but you know, uh, can we just do uh, everything based on one single trial? And the the uh, the, uh, every, uh, the questions which were going on in the uh, neonatologists or the academicians in uh, India, they were like, you know, whether we need to relook at the data, whether we need to pull this data again. And uh, a great effort was put by uh, uh, the NNF working group uh, uh, led by Siddharth Ramji, Deepak Chawla, Praveen Kumar, sir, and and our Dr. Suman also was part of this group. And they did a quite extensive and good work to pull off the data in a very short period of time and looked at all the trials again and individually looked at the data, particularly uh, raising the questions again uh, about the, you know, the mortality and the neurodevelopmental outcome. And uh, there were about, uh, uh, yeah. So you can see there are about 24 RCTs were found and uh, there were seven in the high income countries and 17 in the LMICs. And I'll just quickly go through some of the slides to show the full data of all these trials uh, through the Forest Plus, and then we'll come up with some uh, consensus on it. So as you can see in the high income countries, the pool analysis still show that there is a, redu a reduction in the uh, 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 death before discharge. This is what we are trying to look at, death before discharge. Uh, the heterogeneity was low and the uh, the, the, the pool output was 0.77, so reduction in the death. Similarly, if you look at the LMIC, there are a number of trials which looked at it. And even if we added helix trial from the uh, data from the helix trial, 
the the results are showing there is a reduction in the mortality and you can see the heterogeneity is, is low in this so overall uh, mortality reduction is 0.76 with a good confidence interval looking at the death before discharge studies now where the ph has been reported now it's very important again the issue has been highlighted what was the condition at birth determines the outcome so we need to know about the ph status at birth and also the temperatures at admission so if you look at the those baby who are very sick with ph less than 7 in those also uh, if you look at uh, hic uh, the uh, there's a reduction in the mortality and even if you look at the pool data at the uh, uh, the LMIC, the, there is an overall reduction in the, uh, in the in the mortality. Now, if you look at the pH uh, more than seven, so these are the babies which are born in a better state. The benefits are in fact better. There is a significant reduction in the mortality. Again, the heterogeneity is low here. So again, babies born in good conditions do well. Now, certain now if you mixed all these babies and uh, you know if there is no clear cut information about their condition at birth and if you pull all these data together and looking at all the trial including the helix trial then the uh, then the, the the benefit is not much so you can see this crossing the uh, it's only 0.96 and it's crossing the midline so there is no benefits has been reported now other important thing is about the outborn and inborn again this is a very important issue has been highlighted so if you look at the death before discharge and uh, where there are no outborn newborns or newborns, so all are inborns. Uh, if you look at the LMIC, the outcomes are quite favorable. You know, it's 0. 0.6. So there is a reduction in the mortality. But if you add outborn newborns into it, the reduction, there is no much difference. And you can see it's crossing the midline. So again, it is a very big confounder for cooling babies who are outborn, so especially when you don't know which condition they were born in and how they were transported. Now, again, another important factor, what is the uh, outcome of death if the admission temperature is less than 36, if they're not normothermic at admission, then you can see then there is a no difference in the death uh, mortality before discharge uh, in this baby. But if the admission temperature is normal, then you can see there is a reduction in the mortality. Again, highlighting very important about the care of the babies. Now, this is another scatter plot and linear regression line between the proportion of neonates who had severe HIE and those who died before the discharge. So blue is the intervention arm. Uh, so you can see the blue are the babies who are in the intervention arm and black were in the control arm. I mean, just to summarize this, basically more severe the severity of the HIE, uh, more the chances of the baby will be dying before discharge. And again, as we all see this, uh, the mortality is higher in the severe, severe babies. So again, it depends on what kind of a population of babies you're including in the trial will influence your outcomes. Now, looking at the death or severe disability at 18 to 24 months, if you pull uh, high income countries, again, it has been shown, obviously, there's a reduction uh, in, uh, there's improvement in the, uh, sorry, the, there's improvement in the disability outcomes. Uh, uh, but yeah, if, if you pull up all the data now, recent data, including the Helix trial, there is still improvement in uh, disability, uh, a long-term disability at 18 to 24 months of age. Again, the heterogeneity is not too high in these studies. Now, looking at the cerebral palsy at 18 to 24 months, again, HIC high income countries, it is 0.73 and it is 0.69, including the data from the Helix trial. So there is improvement in the cerebral palsy. So it was concluded that uh, this is from the uh, NNF paper that the, their conclusions were that Therapeutic hypothermia does reduce death and severability, uh, disability and cerebral palsy at 18 to 24 months, in, even in LMSC compared to uh, high income countries. Mortality before discharge for moderate to severe HI for the babies with hot pH less than seven, uh, there was a significant in both the groups. And uh, so again, it's favorable, but hypothermia at admission and unclear evidence of severe intrapartum asphyxia that's the group where there's uncertain benefit from therapeutic hypothermia and it may cause more harm. And the risk of death was increases in the presence of severe encephalopathy. Uh, and that's why, again, it highlights the need of invasive ventilation, anotropic support. And that again highlights the issue that optimum NSU facilities are needed if you want to cool this baby. And the question still remains about the ethnicity, biological factor, genetic variation, difference in the intra exposures. I think these all still need further studies, whether you can conclude 
uh, and, and and say with the affirmation that you know this does make a difference. So their recommendation from the practice is what actually we have already been discussing, and this is the NNF statement for the practicing neonatologist in India. So the first question is where should the therapeutic hypothermia be offered? So yes, I have no doubt that you know it should be a high quality neonatal care level three, level four, especially the nursing ratio. If you try to care for this baby, try to have a one s to one or one s to two nursing, and you should have all the routine facilities for monitoring. And Dr. Professor Vishnu but highlighted that very much. And which neonates should be offered? Again, uh, uh, yes, all I mean this this criteria are pretty standard. Uh, more than thirty six weeks. Again, some centers try to do even more than thirty five. But this is what they proposed. And important is to start within six hours and the admission temperature should be in the normal range. And the criteria followed are, again, pretty much uh, same criteria which followed worldwide. And which neonates should not receive therapeutic hypothermia, that's where, where the important question lies. So babies who are, again, very sick, uh, presenting and with congenital or genetic abnormality, severe growth restriction, severe coagulopathy, uh, if there is a head trauma, intercranial hemorrhage, and then beyond, presenting beyond six hours of age, these are the baby we should probably not cool. And what future from here is, I think we still need individual patient data meta-analysis for all the trials from LMIC uh, to address some specific issue. And uh, there is a high urgent need of a national registry of all the neonates because there are so many centers in India where cooling the data, but I think it's a time, high time to pull this data and come up with some more concrete conclusion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kiran, for uh, uh, summarizing it so clearly and in such short time. Uh, I know we are running late. Uh, uh, I'll just straight away ask Dr. Uh, uh, Sridhar, um, what are your thoughts on this NNF statement? Thank you, uh, Dr. Suman, and thank you, Kiran, for summarizing it so nicely. I mean, obviously, the focus here should be on the points that we have learned from the Helix study as well, that outbound babies are not a homogeneous group. And uh, I mean, before I address the point on the statement, I would like uh, Sudin to consider the question of, there was a study published by Vanya Olivera, I mean, uh, on the pilot project for the Helix trial. And even there, it was clear that 70% of the babies were outborn and you had a clear uh, differentiation in the outcome between outbound and inborn. So could we not have gone back and changed it? And the other point is awareness of what exactly happens in the Indian scene. I mean, when we talk of a center like uh, Institute of Child Health in Chennai, for example, I mean, everyone works hard, no doubt about it, every decade, but there are so many constraints. And when we talk of outbound babies coming to a center like Institute of Child Health, is mostly hospitals who have burned their hands and they want to push away a dying baby. So essentially, we are talking of a situation where we are uh, having a very sick baby who has not received the optimal care and that optimal care is going to damage the brain even more. The absence of a good APGAR score, the absence of uh, documentation of the APGAR score, I mean, the absence of the cord PH and the early seizures, the subacute changes on the brain MRI, it doesn't mean there is suboptimal or anti antenatal care alone. It may also mean the postnatal care has been suboptimal. And we all know that cooling is going to prevent um, further brain damage from the secondary brain injury. Not, It's not going to reverse the brain injury that has happened. And we are talking of a situation where the brain injury is poor in this case, mainly because outborn babies are a totally different category. So it's not to criticize the study. I've done a great job. It's obviously a very difficult uh, position to organize. As Dr. Sita said, the biggest number of babies who may have the power, but did we choose the right babies? Uh, Professor Butt and uh, Dinesh also asked the same point. I mean, did we choose the right patient load to come to a conclusion which we aim to extrapolate to an entire population in all the low and middle income countries? My uh, point is it's not. You have not chosen the right population. So you should go back to the drawing board and think about why we didn't change based on the pilot project. You have spent a lot of money. The funding is there. The training has been there. The data collection has been meticulous. I accept everything. but. If your uh, soil is not the right one, are we going to get the right results? And we cannot compare a baby who is outborn, who has received very poor care, to a baby who is inborn, who is going to get the optimum care from the beginning. We may show genetic differences, but it's not going to be uh, easily understood by many of the people. And what is clear is that they are cooling babies, they are seeing a benefit. And so unless we have comparable populations, we cannot. And the NNF statement, my main comment is going to be 
what Kiran said in the end, the registry is going to be critical. People should really have a clear documentation of what kind of babies. I mean, uh, it was very interesting when Dr. Dinesh presented his data that close to 60% are still outborn. And so if you say don't cool outborn babies, it's not going to be the answer because outborn babies also do not need to be discriminated. But we should be very careful in, especially the referring center should be very careful in documenting from the start trying their best to optimize the care, documenting from the start what exactly is being done. Be very transparent. I know it's a very litigious subject. It's a high risk of medical legal problems. So people may uh, hide information. They may try to push the baby away. That happens in any setup, but in India, it happens even more. They just want to wash their hands of the patient. <laughs> Please go to the next center. It's their headache after that. But we should come to an open system where we address the problem. We give them the clear information. Try to optimize the care and documentation and the registry is going to be critical. So I was thinking of saying the outborn babies should not be cool, but if you don't have enough information on the outborn babies, do not cool them. Or if you don't know, or you don't trust the center where the baby is coming from, it's safer not to cool. So you may damage such babies in cooling. So my comment is to be, the NNF has to take the lead uh, along with IAP in creating a registry with utmost urgency. Having the statement is important, but more important is to monitor what happens subsequent to that. After the ACT study, the WHO came out with very clear criteria, and it's very nice to know Dr. Suman was part of the team. So such criteria have to be applied, I mean, by our bodies first and maybe the WHO later, partly because this will protect our uh, team medical legally. Most of the questions on the chat about the medical legal implications. I don't think people would be blamed for not cooling in the Indian scene now. And at the same time, you won't be blamed just on the basis of the helix study for cooling a baby as well. That is not enough evidence, especially when the scientific community sees that the patient chosen for the study is not appropriate. So both sides won't work. You don't need to be worried if you don't have the facilities to cool or transfer, and you won't be blamed uh, for no, I mean, cooling after the helix study as well. So this is my humble viewpoint that the registry should be applied immediately and there is a huge responsibility on the referring team in entering the appropriate data. So the referred team, I mean, the team to whom the baby is referred to can make the appropriate decision. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sridhar, for uh, saying it so very clearly that now it's a total no blame game in India. You can cool, you will not get blamed. You don't cool, it's still not a standard of therapy. But, but I totally take your point that we need a registry. And that's what we had actually started when we started doing uh, with the Mira Cradle. All of us who were using the Mira Cradle maintained a registry and, and came out as a paper also after that in the initial time. And then I think we all got sort of, oh, cooling is, we are fine with it, we are comfortable. And what Helix has sort of done to all of us who believe in cooling is shaken us up a little bit, made us run back to our data and look at it. And here I give an example of why I think outborn babies have a problem. And this is our inborn baby. This baby did not cry at birth, was floppy, required ventilation. And my resident was all set to cool. And when he called me up, he said, Madam, everything fits into the cooling criteria. Then what's the problem? The problem is your cord ABG. The cord ABG did not satisfy the cooling criteria. And obviously the decision was not to cool. And then when we looked at it, what my resident did not pick up was the cryptorchidism, was the high arched palate, was the lesser coils in the umbilical cord, which were all there. And, and this was actually a case of a neuromuscular disorder. And that's where I think, especially in South India with one third of the population in consanguineous marriages, I wouldn't be surprised that many of the babies who were cool may have come into this. And therefore I do believe that a cord ABG is a must. We somehow need to have it. And we saw that in the NNF statement and at least in my unit following Helix, we are very, very careful about our outborn babies. We have told our residents, if you're going to cool an outborn, you better call us up and let's take a, a, you know, a decision together to decide whether this baby should be cooled. So my question to you, Dr. Dinesh, is how will the NNF position statement affect cooling in the private sector? Uh, you all will be definitely so concerned about the medical legal aspects. And then most of your babies may be outborn, uh, you, I know you have a good retrieval system, but how do you, and how does it affect you all? No, I think, uh, thanks, Suman. Uh, I think what the LNF statement is saying is, uh, one thing it has very clearly highlighted is, 
which type of unit should be cooling. So, you know, I think uh, it has never contested that cooling is harmful. It said cooling is a therapy which can be given. But the unit should have one, two, three, four facilities is one thing. So I think that is one part which should be there. I think which is very important, I think. That, as you said, and I think that Helix trial has just alerted everyone that you just, just can't just cool and keep quiet, that you need to have one, two, three, four. The second thing which has come up is to identify which type of patient should be there. So question of, you know, okay, this child is not, not right, you just pack them up and send to some other hospital so they can be cooled is not what we should be doing. But if you want to do any good to the child, to organize a good transport service for this child is something which got highlighted. And which is what I would say is need to strengthen the emergency transport services in the, both in the public and private sector which is what I highlighted about, even in our case, they were, you know, 50%, uh, close to 50% were transported by us and other have come in. We do not know how many could not reach. Maybe the sicker one could not reach. So there could be some bias in that. I agree with that sort of, I take that criticism also. So I think the statement, what it sort of says is, uh, yes, identify the type of patient, identify the type of unit, Stress the importance of having cord ABG, which is what we have to work with our obstetricians, have some more sort of, uh, you know, uh, perinatal meetings to, uh, you know, ensure that most of the unit which are sort of uh, taking care of this type of patient should have cord ABG as a routine care, so that we identify these patients and you, as you presented the, the previous case, that you differentiate between asphyxia for a child who had a neuromuscular disease. And finally, I think it's very important that who should not be cool also has been identified. So, uh, so identifying the population who is not going to benefit, you know, it has been cautioned. And now, see, some of them are very clear cut. They were not going to benefit a big bleed or uh, you know someone who's come with coagulopathy and other thing, which is what has a statement has been given by the NNF. So, I think from private sector, I think. Uh, cooling is going to continue. I don't think uh, we would uh, have anything to say that we cannot do cooling in LMIC. The only thing, identify the patients, don't take them, you know, up, less than six hours is the time. Though there have been studies that, you know, can we cool after six hours uh, and all the things you want. You have to, the time frame when you start cooling is also very important. Uh, transferring them and not, during transfer, it is not just only the temperature. Did you maintain their oxygenation well? Have you prevented any hypoxia post post set of resuscitation? Because secondary injury can happen post resuscitation also. Have you maintained the blood pressure normally during this phase? All these things are also going to be very important during. So I think the importance of transport has also been stressed. And I think that I think there will be a lot of debate upon what type of cooling machines to be used, servo control cooling versus phase changing material. But one thing is very sure is that you should start cooling. Uh, ASAP in less than six hours and maintain the temperature and prevent hyperthermia is something. So I think as far as consenting is concerned, I think it is, since it is a standard practice in Western country with the definitive evidence, I think you take consent for blood transfusion, you take consent for invasive procedures, uh, we, whether we should introduce that, something is we might review that. But one thing is definitely, I think, we should probably all of the centers, the you know, and I think as an NNF, we have a you know, level three case which are sort of accredited by NNF. We can develop an NNF registry and say whichever whoever is cooling should be reporting that. And then we can look at and review the data in years down the line to see what is happening for all the centers which are cooling. And that way we probably can probably come up with some robust data. Yeah, thank, thank you, Dr. Dinesh. I think we all should work towards creating this registry which will have large number of babies Oh, I think I have only one more question because I know the audience are waiting patiently uh, and maybe we can, we already heard a lot on it. Uh, so Professor Vishnu, but maybe if we can have a very short answer on the one, two, three, four prerequisites that a center should have before they start cooling. Yeah, so I, I put up one slide also on that. Yes. So one thing is the manpower, I think uh, Dr. Sudhir, uh, Dinesh has given most of the required details. They should have enough uh, nursing and uh, monitoring uh, facilities. Should be, there should be continuous monitoring all these uh, infants, both uh, the, his uh, rectal and uh, body temperature has to be monitored. And any complication, they should be taken care. So you should have ventilator facility. You should have ABG machine. You should have neuroimaging facilities. 
and you should have good care. That is very, very important. That's why level three care, probably NNF is also stressing. So unless you have sufficient care, because during cooling complication can develop, then you will be held responsible for, for it for cooling without having facilities. So it is not like giving paracetamol to a fever patient. We should be very, very careful, I think. And any procedure, the parents have to be informed, whether you give blood, whether you put an IV line, whether you do cooling, they have to be told the pros and cons, and uh, they have to be taken into confidence. Yeah, thank you, sir. Um, quality of care is, is so, so important to every outcome that we you know, look at. Uh, we have more questions, but I think we need to go to the audience. And I hand over to Dr. Aravanan to take on, and you know, you have a difficult job of going through so many questions and filtering out a few to manage in this time. Over to you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, may I know how, how much time do we have before minutes, I start? Yeah. I think Sorry? only 15 minutes we'll have to wrap up uh, because I think- Because I have a lot of questions. Maybe I will direct to, uh, yeah. each one of you. Uh, I selected uh, you know, a couple of questions and a lot of people uh, writing in chat box as well. Thank you everyone for the excellent contribution. I will start with the first question uh, for the recent speaker, uh, which is Kiran Moore. Uh, one of the uh, delegate was asking why the NNS position statement did not grade the evidence unlike other position statement. What was the quality and certainty of the evidence from NNS position statement? Uh, to you, Kiran, a very short answer. So as I said, it was a statement. It was not a CPG or a guideline. There's a need for a, making a proper clinical practice guideline and grading and evidence and everything it takes time. So I think uh, this this will happen probably in the near time. But I think the idea was to quickly look at the data and publish data and they came up with the consensus. But yes, there has there needs to be a full th thorough process needs to undergo uh, for grading and evidence and everything, which is I think will be coming soon. And maybe Dr. Suman can answer. Yeah, something. I can answer that very well. See, we, we had this thing of coming out with a statement at super speed because people were concerned about getting sued for malpractice if they cooled. And therefore, we needed to look at literature and, and CPG guidelines, you know, take time. The next set of CPG guidelines has taken more than a year for us to bring it out. And because of this need to bring it out, it was a quick review of whatever published data was there. And we did not look at, you know, the quality of it, whatever was in the public domain, if it was randomized control trial, that is what was considered. We had Dr. Ranjan Pejavar in a group telling us, when is it coming out? When is it coming out every week? And that was exactly why it came out in super speed and it did not go through the rigor of grading or risk of bias assessment. That hopefully should come out in the near future. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, I think the next question to, uh, Professor Sudin, and uh, how many centers were part of Elix trial stop cooling after the results? Uh, Professor Sudin? Well, in Helix trial, none of them are cooling. Uh, but I just, um, you know, the pilot study we did um, on in ICH, um, uh, that was on outborn babies. It was a non-randomized trial, and it showed 50% reduction in mortality with cooling. So this is why non-randomized trial trials will show uh, a selection bias and will show benefit. Um, and like Sita said, you know, the only evidence we have on cooling from LMICs is from the Helix trial. So that is definitely, you know, scientifically, there is no basis for continuing cooling in LMICs, especially in private settings that cannot be justified. So none of the Helix trial uh, sites are cooling. So as of now, the all seven centers are not cooling uh, for therapeutic hypothermia. Yeah, yeah. Even the centers who were cooling previously, like Hubli, they all stopped. I mean, they are, um, yeah. I mean, there have been a lot of, you know, MD thesis, this kind of studies yeah. going on with cooling, but many all of right. them are kind of stopping, yeah. Thank you, Professor. So then, which brings another question. Dr. Ismat Jahan mentioned about uh, they started cooling uh, with the Elix trial only. They don't have any prior experience. Uh, compared to other six centers, this center is totally different which uh, one of the delegate asked the question about the internal validity. And how do you address that? I think uh, the question is about this center is starting cooling with uh, Elix only, but other six centers might be doing cooling for a long time. And I think the question is the question of internal validity. I didn't understand completely, but that was the- I can, I can take that, um, um, I don't know, because we, all the sites, we did extensive training. 
I think between you know, Sira and I, we got reasonable experience of cooling therapy. So all we went out to all the sites. So we are literally hand-holding with each of those babies. And uh, it, Ismet sites in, in Dhaka, that's one of the top premier universities. It's like the aims of you know, India. They have one-to-one -one care. And um, Ismet is an absolutely brilliant in there. And there's a you know, full-fledged team. And they were one of our best group in the Helix trial. Okay, fine. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Sudin. I think uh, then. Arvind, you muted accidentally. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yes. So um, I'll go with my uh, next question, uh, which actually uh, to but sir, um, whether DNA study was done in severe hypoxia or moderate hypoxia babies. If it is done severe hypoxia, it cannot be extrapolated into mild moderate hypoxia. And can there be an observed bias? The DNA damage, what we have looked into is the mean difference of the damaged DNA between the cooled and uncooled group. So it includes both moderate and severe asphyxiation, not the individual ones. I showed you some pictures where normal cell, when you do electrophoresis, how, does, how do they look like? When mild hypoxia, what happens? moderate, severe. So as the severity increases, oxidative stress goes up, DNA damage also increases. So similar thing, what uh, Dr. Sudin was showing on the DNA will happen because whatever stress is severe, it will cause DNA damage. It will reflect on the DNA and uh, definitely it will be seen. We have done some studies with sepsis, not with asphyxia. The sepsis babies who are having poor outcome are different in the sense uh, their methylation, everything is different. Their sequencing of genes have been done. They are different in the sense uh, it is not the baby itself. There will be some difference between the babies because the parents are different. Their DNA markers are different. So individually there will be variation, but it does not mean a baby with sepsis comes, you won't, don't give antibiotics. Any sensible person will not tell. Suppose if a baby comes with sepsis, will you give antibiotics or not? Or because your DNA is different, you don't give antibiotics. That is the point I'm trying to tell. If you do ventilation for all hypoxiated uh, babies, your mortality will be 80-90%. But if you put a ventilator more than 95% or almost 100%, they survive. So it depends upon the selection of cases. If you do a best cardiac surgeon, does cardiac surgery, when the patient has gone to cardiac failure and has become very uh -huh. sick, operate, he will die. So that is the thing. See the here, basic problem is the case selection. Uh, that is the main issue with the helix trial, which I am trying to tell. Whether Thank Sudhir you. likes it or not, he's my good friend also. So I have to tell what I feel. I have told him all this, but- Sorry, uh, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, we'll be always good <laughs> friends. You know, I need to go in two minutes. Is there anything more for me? Uh, um, I don't know. Sorry. Uh, yes. Uh, is yeah. there any questions uh, there for one, me? One, one, one question. Uh, I think it's okay. it can, you can answer or uh, uh, Professor Sita can answer. I think uh, yeah. you, they did mention about the Toby trial and NICHD trial that hypothermia in the control group was high, which caused a deleterious effect in the control group. And uh, so are we thinking that the beneficial effect of uh, cooling is kind of uh, masked on those trials? Would you like to kind of uh, redo the trial in this high income countries to prove the cooling benefits? I think Sida can take that. I'll, I'll make a uh, move then. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you for joining. Bye -bye. Thank, you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I, do, I don't Let's think see. it is, uh, I don't think there's going to be any trial that is going to look at, um, you know, elevated temperature uh, that is controlled versus hypothermia because you have to realize the fact that the, there was elevated temperature in the control group uh, was something that was actually discovered during the, the trial. So uh, it, it, um, uh, it really brought up the fact that in the, you know, that if you were to evaluate temperature among HIE infants, that many of them have elevated temperature. That was brought out at that time. So subsequently, after the first three 
uh, major trials of four, including ICE, after the first four major trials were published, uh, then everyone really is being very careful about temperature management. So um, there really is not going to be any study that will be done because the, the data is, is very convincing. Um, we showed that the risk of death or disability goes up with every one degree Celsius increase in temperature. Um, and um, there have been um, um, non-invasive studies that have evaluated brain temperature that have been that have demonstrated that elevated brain temperature is associated with um, you know with death, death or disability. So it's very unlikely that 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 there's ever going to be a trial looking at that. Um, but it's pointed out the fact that you know we need to look at uh, at temperature management. If you look at the adult uh, trials for cardiac arrest and the pediatric uh, out of hospital cardiac arrest um, and in hospital cardiac arrest studies, you know they the reason that they really um, are cooling is because um, the the they have noted in the in their populations that there was elevated uh, temperature among brain injured adults and pediatric patients so i think it's it's quite a well known uh, well established fact now thank you ma'am uh, i think one more question to you uh, i think uh, it's uh, specifically about that if provided that nichd is funding another trial in low income countries and uh, you are mm -hmm. kind of uh, have a choice to select centers, which is kind of different than the seven centers. Would you, <laughs> would you kind of uh, run the trial with the a large, like same, like adequate power and everything? Would you think that the outcome would be different? Uh, no, no, I, do, I don't think I said NICHD is going to fund. No, no, I'm just, I think it's a question about that. Uh, 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 is there <laughs> another file coming in? So do you think that that is going to change the outcome if the selection of centers is different? I think that's what uh, the uh... well. I mean, any any um, you know the the studies that are done um, are really based on the amount of funding to do the studies, and so um, you know whether you look at the Toby trial or the or the ICE trial or the NICHD trial, you know it's the funding agency that decides how much they're going to spend and then invites centers. To, to participate. The NICHD trial, the first trial we did was uh, about $1.4 million, um, you know, which many would consider expensive, but um, it really costs money to train all the centers, make sure everybody is very well trained to select the in infants and then to do the study conduct. So, Doing randomized controlled trials are very expensive. A major part of the expense is follow-up. And the, for, any, uh, for a hypothermia or any neuroprotective intervention, your outcome really should be follow-up, not just death in the NICU or death at discharge, but it should be follow-up. And the earliest follow-up where we can actually uh, confidently uh, diagnose cognitive and motor problems is 18 months of age. So I would encourage the NNF to also include that any infant who is schooled should be followed to 18 months of age. Thank you, ma'am. Just uh, one more Thank question you. to Sita, ma'am, we can answer because uh, uh, I can ask, uh, uh, because Sudhin has left. This is coming from Shilpa, Dr. Shilpa Kalane in Helix style. The sentinel acute perinatal events were less than 30%. percent Abka mm -hmm. scores were less than or equal to 5 to 10 minutes. Less than 50% of the helix patients were uh, uh, inborn. Uh, and less than 50% uh, were assisted ventilation. And cord gases were available only in 10% of the helix patients. So this suggests that more than 50% of the helix patient would have probably not have been eligible with uh, Sita Shankaran's uh, 2005 study. So, no, no, no. No, that is that is incorrect. The and the uh, the um, enrollment criteria were exactly the same as the NICHD trial. Um, the 
conduct of the trial was the same and the follow-up was also the same, uh, except that we used Bailey 3 uh, rather than the Bailey 2, because by that time, the Bailey 3 was published. So the uh, inclusion criteria were infants who were um, equal to or greater than 36 weeks gestation and who had pH less than seven uh, at birth or within one hour of age. And if the, if the pH was not available, they had to have a history of a perinatal sentinel event and need for resuscitation that was continued for a minimum of 10 minutes. So the criteria were very, very strict. And the criteria were checked on every infant at the time of enrollment. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, over to Erwin. Um, I think uh, many of the questions were already answered by the panelists and the speakers. So I don't want to repeat all the questions unless uh, one of one of the uh, panelists or, uh, wants to ask any questions. Otherwise, I will uh, hand it over to Dr. Suman, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I, I don't do, do any of the panelists want to respond to anything else in the chat or the Q&A? Can I make a point about the question that Kiran raised? I mean, yeah, please, Dr. Sridhar. I think the Helix trial centers have a moral obligation not to cool because they're part of a study and they have to stand their ground. But for the other centers, I don't think that holds. So their position would not be a medical legal position. And again, one study funded and it's a high quality study in terms of numbers, which patient choice. I mean, there are so many articles which have criticized that study in both IJP and Lancet. So I don't think any court will hold you wrong for cooling just on the basis because the cooling is uh, said as a, in a negative tone by the study. So that is my view. I would like to hear what the other panelists think. Professor Butt and Dinesh have already made their points. And I don't know if Professor Sita has any comments on the medical legal position based on this. What does she think? Um, no, not really. I, I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, familiar with the medical legal climate since I've actually, you know, been in the United States for the last uh, 45, 46 years. So I'm not aware of that. Um, can I add one, one way to look at it is maybe I mean, how the US uh, courts would react if a study like this comes, where, I mean, you have a significant finding. I think the one very important finding from the Helix trial that I see is that the uh, cheap equipment that was designed does cool well. So if at all the centers decide to cool, they can. I don't know if they are released to market it now or how, what will be the impact? I mean, will they be stopping? Because Sudin mentioned in the beginning that they will only produce uh, commercially after the study results, but now because your study doesn't recommend it, would they still be released to produce that equipment? Because you show, showed that it works well. It's cost effective, it works well. I know it doesn't have the servo control, but still for the purpose of keeping it in that temperature range, it works well. So it's probably better than the uh, phase change materials as Sudin pointed out. So this could be a positive we take from the Helix study. But I'm not sure about the legal impact of that on the company yeah, I, as well. Yeah, I, I think. Oh, we can't hear you, ma'am. Uh, just uh, you, please unmute, ma'am, again. You're muted. Please unmute again. Uh, we can't hear so. Mm. <laughs> I think yeah, the computer has given up. I think. <laughs> so Actually, I, I, what I'm uh, trying to say is that if a baby is eligible to cooling, and you have facility, if you do not cool, I think you will be medical legal issued for not cooling. If you have facility and if the baby fulfills the criteria, if you do not cool, the other way around. Now, uh, prevent study 
keel study so many studies one they may want to baby so who are not cold but i think it will be unethical not to cool the babies if you have facilities you tomorrow you will be sued definitely see the prevent study keel study if you see they want uh, infants who are not cold in the sense they want to see whether that is effective or not but it is uh, ethically wrong you should not hold cooling if the infant requires cooling and if you have facilities that is my impression Dr. i agree with dr vishnu but i yeah. think see when there is a proven therapy uh, and uh, we are saying that you should not use it this based on one study probably you are more liable medical legally um, and by not cooling specific, specifically the child finds uh, fits into the criteria comes to your hospital in these things and then uh, you say you know no no it is on the helix trial i'm not going to cool i think you're going to be a lot more in problem that's my personal view see those uh, who are in the foreign think, countries uh, yes, that's my yes, yes. but those who so, are in india will face the problem so my, my suggestion have been my my and i think we're closing law my statement would be and of course prevention is best try to sort of be in close and try to encourage code abg by having more prenatal meetings second is you know look at for those babies who qualify for cooling based on those who require resuscitation based on the cord abg or based in rapgars if you decide to cool ensure that your unit has the facility infrastructure monitoring and medical expertise and nursing expertise wise to do that if not transfer them appropriately to a center which can do that is what i would say at this stage now for those who still sort of believe or do not i think someone has raised that in the chat box let's maintain the registry of what is happening at this stage and this ethically i still strongly believe that we probably are not right to do a rct based on this this is my strong opinion as as a country we, we probably cannot submit our babies to a randomized control trial because i've seen many babies who had and you know, i didn't get chance who had ph of 6.7 6.8 bad asphyxia who have done wonderfully well on follow up we'll share our follow up data very shortly but this and it has been well proven that you know it does help it is protective i think it is a type of injury which is there yes if it is a chronic hypoxia it doesn't help just because chronic hypoxia doesn't mean acute hypoxia doesn't happen in our country so choose your patients well and cool that's my message for today thank you uh th thank you dr dinesh for your message i think we can go to the final messages from all panelists if uh, dr kiran would that be fine yeah yeah of course yeah so i think dr dinesh has uh, given uh, his message beautifully uh, professor vishnu but uh, uh, what message would you like to give no that's what i said uh, you should uh, cool first of all you should have enough facility secondly the infant should fulfill the cooling criteria what is laid down if they are fulfill then definitely you should cooling and cooling should not be done in places where there is no facilities and you cannot monitor the patient obviously you should not do and uh, i think regionalization of cooling uh, facility and proper delivery proper resuscitation appropriate transfer to these centers and cooling will be the best but of course we have a long way to go because uh, finance may be one of the major issues i would have been very happy if uh, had it study some fund would have been spent on improving the infrastructure uh, which would have been helped to many people so thank you sir for again emphasizing about quality of care uh, now i request dr isma jahan for your message if it's a one liner it was even more better yes uh thank you um, so to, uh, to sum up intervention efficacies trial finding results will uh, talk in its own way so trial findings itself publications itself systematic review um, in course of time so we just need to wait and see and uh, we will understand and we will take decision what uh, we need to do for our babies thanks thank you thank you dr ismat dr shridhar You I would like to congratulate all of you. Uh, so excellently organized, and I'm sure it's a very useful session for everyone. 
My point is that uh, I think I agree with Dr. Dinesh, but we should wait for the registry data for five years or so, establish the registry uh, on a war footing, make sure it's collected stringently, review the data before we design another study because we don't want to burn your hands uh, with repeating a study like this. There is a lot of effort into all these studies, so we should get the right information. So compare the outbound, inborn, uh, compare the private hospitals, government hospitals, and make a clear decision on the patient choice when it comes to designing the next study. And hopefully that may be the first uh, long-term, I mean, uh, multicentric study in this format from India. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sridhar. Um, uh, uh, Sita. Professor Sita, I don't know whether Madam can, no, we can hear her, but I would just like to, um, uh, Madam has typed out here. Um, uh, very interesting discussions based on Helix. I would not encourage cooling until there is, then I can't see what else. Maybe more data or a registry. <laughs> okay. So she's answered I, one more comment previously, I think. Uh, yeah, and Madam has yeah. cautioned, Professor Sita Shankaran has strongly cautioned us on the therapeutic creep and, and uh, make sure that you're not cooling the mild encephalopathies. And there's no efficacy data or safety data on these babies. So thank you, Professor Sita Shankaran, for giving us your three hours uh, for this panel discussion. We, we thoroughly enjoyed having you here. Um, I would like to make one comment, which we keep hearing here, quality of care. I think that is the most important aspect that we need to strengthen. Yes, if you think like, for example, if your NMR in your unit is low, I think cooling probably makes a difference definitely for your inborn babies. And if you're doing it well, maybe you could continue. But, and registry is something that we need to do on a war footing but we need to be cautious on our outborn babies. We need to find a solution. Maybe we need to go and retrieve them, transport them, take care of them, have a liaison with the, with the uh, centers which are sending us these babies, but we need to be cautious for our outborns. And I hand over to Dr. Kiran More and Dr. Uh, Aravanan for their final comments. Thank you. Aravan, you go first. <laughs> oh. Thank you. Thank you, Kiran. Thank you, Dr. Swanam. Thank you, uh, Professor Sita and uh, other panelists. It, it was an excellent session. I think, uh, I don't think I had an academic taste in the last two years because of the COVID. <laughs> uh, this is an interesting session. I uh, learned so much from uh, all the senior people. And uh, I do agree uh, with all the uh, uh, panelists' comments. And uh, thank you, ma'am. And we do be very cautious with uh, not to cool mild HIE and preemie babies until we have more uh, efficacy and safety data. I think uh, that's a kind of uh, take-home message uh, for myself, and uh, um, I'll hand it over to Kiran. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Arman. Thank you. I mean, I will not repeat anything. I think everything has been said repeated times. I, I hope the messages are clear now, and this was the whole idea of having this session. I would just like to thank everyone, all the faculty, to, for giving uh, time on a weekend, and a Saturday for three hours. We were expecting to finish in two hours, uh, and uh, Sudhin uh, has left, but a special thanks to him and Professor Sita for giving such a time, and all the faculties uh, really, you know, uh, making their points and sharing their data and experiences. It was really wonderful session. Special thank to Dr. Suman for conducting and moderating this session in such a balanced way. And we really, I think everyone definitely enjoyed. We had about 150 participants and everyone stayed till end. That's, I think, the uh, I, I think uh, credit goes to all the part, uh, faculties uh, for making this interesting. So with that, I will uh, end this session. Thank you very much. We look forward to come up with some more interesting sessions in future. And uh, uh, I thank on behalf of uh, NNF Qatar and Inspire uh, organization uh, from Qatar uh, to, you know, uh, uh, giving us opportunity to host this session and agreeing for this session. So with that, uh, we'll end. It's 8 o'clock here and I think 10.30 in India. So thank you very much. Thank uh, you, everyone. Uh, last but not least, I need to thank Kiran because uh, he, he put an uh, enormous amount of time and energy to organize and connect, uh, you know, most important people, which we I never had opportunity to meet them and uh, talk with them. So thank you, Kiran. Thank you so much for your time and energy. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Okay, thank you. Bye, -bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.